Good afternoon. How are y'all doing? Yeah. 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 Well. Okay. It's always so nice to see like, people ready with their notes and everything. It's like, I'm ready to learn. <laughs> That's always fun. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for being ready to learn. <laughs> We're going to learn from Billy Bramer. So, Billy Bramer, um, is it cohort four? Is it? Yes. Yes. Nick. So, Billy Bramer was in cohort four. He worked on a game called Bizarre Craft, which was incredible because a capstone team sought to make an RTS. I believe it or not, yes. That's like one of the highest aspirations to try to do. And of course, they wisely honed it down uh, very quickly. Yeah. <laughs> not partly, quickly enough. <laughs> not, 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 <laughs> partly due to my own encouragement that yes, you need Eric to uh, winnow this down, please, for the love of God. Um, and they did, they did, they did. They finally made something that's like, wow, you, you, know, you made a respectable piece of an RTS. You have a little bit of a level editor in there which was uh, pretty impressive to do. I have to say, because Billy wouldn't, wouldn't say this, that Billy Bramer was one of those guys who has the combination of things that we talk about, which is, can you be extremely highly skilled, like in this amazing rock star and what you do, but also be like the world's nicest person at the same time? Hard to get both those right. And he's one of those guys that did that. Yeah, that definitely bore out in his reputation and, and in RPP and so forth. He was like, wow. So have I made you feel comfortable enough? Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I can't stand up to this now. Like, okay. just pack it up, go home from here. Yeah. <laughs> yes. um, so he's working at Iron Galaxy in Chicago, right out of school. Nope. Uh, several different programmers. Midway. I'm sorry? Midway. Oh, I'm sorry, Midway, yes. So Midway first <laughs> in Chicago. Before Midway, they, they worked. So um, he was working out there at Midway, and he became really good in Unreal. Like, really good in Unreal. And what that can often lead to is going to work for them. <laughs> so that's what happened. Um, not an easy place to get into at all. And so um, we're very proud of what Billy's been able to achieve. And uh, he's been a uh, powerful programmer, but also has a design sensibility too as well uh, with what he, what he does. So I'm sure that you'll learn tons of stuff from him. I'm excited because he's talking about Fortnite, which is always fun. Anything about Epic is fun too. And so he's going to do this talk, he has some Q&A, and then we'll wrap that and then um, take a little break because he's also offered to talk about Unreal for a while for those that wish to hear more about Unreal. Sound good? Awesome. And hello to those tuning in. I'm sure you're chatting away on the forums, <laughs> writing awkward things, and questions to ask Billy. <laughs> Keep it up. JT will moderate the weird stuff. Okay, so, all right, I, please join me in welcoming Billy Bramer. <laughs> Well, thank you for the introduction that I on no way I can live up to, but that's <laughs> that's all right. Uh, so normally, you know, the past few times that I've come back, I kind of try to talk about life lessons that I've learned in my career. Uh, I've been in the industry about nine years now. I've been at Epic for six. Uh, and I had mentioned to Ron, I was like, oh, I don't know. I kind of rambled last time, and it might be kind of boring to keep doing that. And he's like, oh, yeah, people learn life lesson stuff all the time. You could maybe try to include something more about how like Fortnite has gone or how like working at Epic has been. So I kind of switched the talk to, to cover that kind of stuff. And so I'm, I'm using that also as the scapegoat that if this talk sucks, then we're all going to blame Ron. Okay? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we'll start with who am I? Uh, I started at UCF, got a computer science degree, came here, as he mentioned, in cohort four, which hearing what cohort you guys are in has made me feel. Uh, moved on to a small indie studio named Phosphor, also in Chicago, and then I've been at Epic for the last about six years. Uh, so at Midway, I was working on an unannounced third person, like, hero-based game. Uh, this is some concept art that may or may not have been from that project. You know, it was unannounced and then midway kind of folded. We got the great news that our, uh, our team was laid off and their services no longer needed on Christmas, which <laughs> was, was super fun. Uh, but I did have a great time while I was at Midway. It was my first experience with a large code base and a large project and what that means and how overwhelming that can be for the first time. Uh, Fortunately, from there, uh, one of my bosses started a small indie studio named Phosphor. Uh, had a lot of ex-Midway employees. I was one of the very first employees they had. They did a lot of, uh, if you haven't heard of them, they've done mobile games. They also worked with Microsoft and did uh, the 
like Connect Packing game, they helped work on that and stuff. But for most of my time at Phosphor, I was working through them, contracted with Epic to work on at the time, which was still UE3 and bug fixes and things, and helping a little bit on ship Gears of War 3 as they were like trying to, to finish it up. And I ended up in a really fortunate and unique circumstance there where they needed help kind of putting the single player DLC together for, for Gears 3, and they didn't have a lot of engineering resources. So I got to be one of the primary people to work on that early. And I, I include this screenshot because this was a thing that while I was doing the contracting, I, I was a huge Gears of War fan, right? So I was I was fanboying while I was working. I was like, oh, this is awesome, right? And uh, one of the co-op characters they were going to have you play in the, the DLC was, was this guy. And I was like, but what if instead of, you know, just being boring and walking around with like the club, what if like he could reflect things off his shield and do damage that way and that'd be his primary weapon? And they were like, uh, I don't know, maybe. So then I just prototyped it myself, right? I was like, here it is, guys, look at this. And, you know, that was that was a lot of fun. Like that ended up shipping, they got into the game. And I, at that point too, I was very grateful and respectful of Epic because I was like, wow, I came in as a contractor, right? I, I wasn't even working for them officially, right? I was contacted to them. I prototyped the thing. They're like, yeah, that's cool. Let's put it in the game, right? And so that was that was a really neat experience. From there, I moved on to Epic where I have been. And here's some, some pictures of our studio in Cary, North Carolina. Uh, I always kind of joke that I, I wish that this is like a, a spaceship's like blast shield door. I keep wanting to find a button that's like going to close it and like secure the facility, but that doesn't happen. Um, because we're all a bunch of children, we have a slide in the middle of our studio. Uh, it actually got nerfed, which is is really disappointing because people injured themselves on this. So now now it had to like be sanded down so that it's slower so that you don't launch yourself like completely. <laughs> but uh, it's pretty great. And then this is our, our cafeteria, and there's like a rock climbing wall and all that stuff. But it, you know, it's a really cool studio and a really neat facility. Uh, as, as Ron mentioned, Epic is probably most famous for working on the Unreal Engine and UE4 now. In the past, they've been very famous for Gears of War, which I did help contribute on. Uh, they've also done Unreal Tournament, uh, Paragon, perhaps, if you've heard of that. I haven't worked on any of these, though. Uh, they also did Robo Recall for VR. They were, you know, this was uh, probably the most recent thing that wasn't one of the huge games that got released uh, to a lot of fanfare. But for me, I have spent most of my six years at Epic working on Fortnite, which came out of, in early access this year. Uh, and the PvP part is like totally free. The PvE part is still in early access and playable. If you're not familiar with it, it is a building action game. The PvE part has RPG elements in the campaign. Uh, I've been very fortunate to contribute significant portions to this game, as you might imagine, working on it for <laughs> that many years. Uh, in particular, I think the, the most forward-facing thing that I spent probably the most amount of time on early is the system that lets people build walls and build their bases and stuff. I contributed a lot to that. So if you haven't seen it, I did include, this is one of the early gameplay trailers around launch time, just so you can get a sense of what it looks like and the kind of features that are there. So there's the, the trailer. So you have a, a frame of reference for what we're talking about. So for the next section, I was going to get a little bit of like how Epic works internally, how we, how we do things. Uh, this is a good reminder to myself that I forgot. Obviously, my boss and company know that I'm here, but I am coming as an unofficial representative. right? So throughout this, there are going to be opinions that are pretty strictly my own. right? This is not an official platform of like Epic's providing, but I just want to get that out of the way. Um, so Epic, as I mentioned, headquartered in Cary. Uh, it was, you know, we have studios worldwide now, but most of our employees are still at the Carry studio that I showed the pictures of. It was founded by this man here, Tim Sweeney, that you perhaps have heard of before. Uh, he's, you know, I view him as an engineering genius. Like he, He's just an incredible engineer and has contributed a lot to the industry over the years. But I think the part that a lot of people probably don't know about him, because maybe the only time you ever see him is if it's like SIG graph or a presentation, right, and he's talking about the engine, is that for somebody who is in charge of a company that is large and is successful and has been open for, I think, 26 years now, right, 
he is so polite and nice and cares so much about his employees. And it's, it's like really awesome to see. I mean, he does, we do a company meeting like every month or so, does an open QA, super transparent, ask literally anything you want, right? He's going to go over it. And that's, I think that's really rare. And it's part of the reason why so many of the employees at Epic love working there. The retention rate is very high, right? Like, because at the end of the day, even if I disagree with something that gets a decision that gets made, like I know at the top highest level, he's got our back, right? Right from the get-go. And so it's, it's really impressive. Um, in terms of the structure inside the studio, we have our game team. So like, you know, there's a team that's working on Paragon. You have the team that's working on Fortnite. And then you have the engine team, which is kind of subdivided into a whole bunch of little little groups that all are working on individual features or trying to work on stuff. This is probably a super gross oversimplification. And if there's anybody at work, they're probably like, you forgot my department. <laughs> and so I'm apologizing in advance to them. But basically, you know, the engine team will split up. Each of these little subgroups will kind of have their own initiatives that they care a lot about or things that they want to make sure that they advance. Um, and then we kind of structurally, code-wise, I guess, right? Like each of them also will probably work in their own branch, right? Like so they have time that they can go spin off on their own features without breaking the rest of the engine. And then they all merge it back and then they become the big public releases of the Unreal Engine when it releases. Um, for me, I've never been a huge like engine programming kind of person. Like while I was contracting at Phosphor, I certainly did a lot of uh, things for DB3 engine and editor in particular. But my heart has always been in gameplay programming. So I don't as easily identify in this space. But the thing that I think is really impressive about them as well is they're always kind of driving technology forward. And it's really awesome to be a part of at the company and see the crazy stuff that they come up with. And they get to work with external partners to do great things. And so like I have this clip from, this is the most recent SIG graph. So, to redefine the state of the art, Epic and Tencent have partnered together with Mike Seymour, with Trilateral, and with Cubic Motion um, to carry out an experiment that we think is really going to uh, be interesting for the folks in this room. Uh, and to introduce this project, I'd like to hear a few words from Mike Seymour uh, up on the screen. This is our Digital Kingdom project, which is a collaboration of a whole lot of companies. Epic Games, Three Lateral, Cubic Motion, Tencent, uh, the Wiki Human Team, Sydney Uni, FX Guide, a whole bunch of people coming together to produce, well, a virtual human. And not only a virtual human, but one rendered in real time. Puppeteered or driven in real time, rendered in real time, and not only that, but at 90 frames a second, in the stereo, in VR. So this was a demonstration that the engine team got to work on, which is actually really impressive when you see and like understand what it's doing, right? Like as as they mentioned, that was rendering in real time. And I believe when they did this presentation at SIGGRAPH, like if you were actually there, they were doing it as like a VR teleconference with other people. So that like he's sit literally sitting there with this apparatus on his head and like moving his face around. And then that's the representation that's being sent to other people like that they're watching. And then the, I think to show the stark comparison, they had him talking to somebody using like a traditional like kind of avatar that you might see in a, like a chat program. And so they had like him versus the normal avatar. And it was crazy. And it's like, you know, I'm busy working on Fortnite. And then like this comes up, I'm like, man, you guys are wizards. I, like, I don't, even, <laughs> I don't even know what you're doing over there. <laughs> so uh, for Fortnite itself and for our game teams, you know, we're kind of also split. We have a ton of different roles. Uh, again, the, the caveat, I know I forgot people. I'm so sorry. But this is the basic gist. Our engineering department is not as divided as you might expect, right? We have like gameplay programmers, which are kind of expected to both be generalists and be able to cover a wide swath of things. Uh, you know, you're not expected to know everything, but as an example, like for gameplay stuff, I, I do gameplay stuff. I do some overlap with design things. I, right, I do a lot of our networking stuff for our game. Uh, I'm starting to learn some of our back end like code as well, right? So we kind of do that. We have a small UI team, though a lot of our gameplay programmers chip in with UI too, because there is more UI than we could ever hope to accomplish otherwise. And then we have a couple of like engineers who are kind of core central tech, like if there's a big perf issue or you know something like that, that's what they'll work on. Uh, for me, in particular, I'm kind of a hybrid. Uh, because I'm a lead, I do both gameplay programming and management. So from a gameplay programming standpoint, that normally is I'll go work with our designers. You know, We'll figure out 
what feature is important to work on right now, what our goal is, kind of iterate through. I help them scope, like this is technically feasible, this isn't, this is how we could do this. Um, I think a skill that gameplay programmers should look to acquire is, I feel like gameplay programmers are in a very unique spot of once you know the code base very well, you're kind of the best qualified person on the project to be able to help people with like, okay, I know you're wanting to do feature X, but if we make a couple slight tweaks here and we do this, I'm, we can do it in like a quarter of the time because I know how all the tech works, right? And so that's that's a lot of my job too. I try to do those kind of checks. Because um, I'm a lead, I also do management stuff. I have direct reports. I'm responsible for you know checking in on them, trying to get their career growth, making sure they're happy. Uh, and I kind of geek out over that kind of stuff, right? It's maybe it's a little lame, but I'm like, oh man, we're gonna we're gonna give you such a great opportunity right now, right? Like that's that's <laughs> the kind of stuff I love, and and I think it's important if you're gonna be a manager to kind of feel that way. Uh, and another part of Epic that I'm really grateful for, and is a shift that they have made since I've gotten there, is they kind of recognize that. The traditional tech pattern, I think, like most tech companies do, your career growth trajectory is like, as you get more and more senior and as you become more qualified, oh, the next step is you're going to be a lead now. And that means you're in charge of people. There you go. Good luck. But if you're a person who like just wants to code or you just want to do art, right? Or, you know, and then you're put in that role and you literally have like, I don't want to deal with these people, then you're setting yourself and them up for failure, right? And I think a lot of tech companies do that. They're like, well, the next step to being a senior programmer is to have people under you, uh, good luck. And Epic has actually separated them out, right? So it's not considered a like promotion, it's kind of like the, the a side track, right? You can continue through your career as an individual contributor and they'll like continue to advance you that way, or you can do it as a manager. Uh, I'm. They're also letting me kind of like skirt a little hybrid role because I'm very reluctant to completely give away coding because I, I very much love that as well. So I have a small group of reports, kind of manage them, and do my coding stuff too. We're divided into strike teams. We pick uh, the varying number. I think right now we're going to be in three, but we've had up to like six at a time. They each get a different focus. Like, hey, you guys are focused on combat and AI. You guys are focused on doing the UI in the front end. You guys are going to add this new feature that players are going to see in like two months. And then we work for like three week little mini sprints. So we'll plan out up front. This is what we think we can get done in, in three weeks. We're going to try to accomplish it. And then off everybody goes. Uh, a new recent addition since we've been live is also doing live support, right? Maintaining a live game is kind of an ordeal. And that's, that's some stuff that we'll get into later. Uh, but that's a big part of my job. So Fortnite itself, you saw the trailer. I kind of want to go into the beginning because this is this is an interesting part to me too. Uh, I was not on Fortnite from its very very beginning. It predates me by a little bit, but it was dramatically different than the game I just showed you the trailer for, right? So it actually was born out of an internal game jam. People had finished Gears and they were like, "What are we going to do next?" They started kind of doing a game jam and working on different stuff, and they knew they wanted to do like this building game and they want to have buildings in there. But you might notice that it's like up here there's like kind of like this dark little like creepy thing, and it's the game was actually like dark and super grim at the beginning, like totally counter to what you'd seen. And it was very small scoped too. The original intention of this was like, hey, everybody had been making these big games, Gears, for, for a long time. We're going to take Fortnite. We're going to make it in a few, like maybe four or five months. And we're going to go ahead and put it out on like the indie arcade or something and be done with it, move on to the next project. Uh, obviously, six years later, that is not what happened. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but basically, you know, I think it was a lot of people liked it. They lashed onto the mechanics and then kind of they keep wanting to add more and more and more and more. And then as we did that, you eventually run into things that we just didn't have. So we had to write them from scratch, which we'll get into later. Um, but for me, I kind of feel like I've grown up with this game now. It's it's been six years, uh, and so I've seen all these changes, right? Like, so this is this is an example of some of like the original concept art and like how grim it was getting. And this is like that guy's super creepy, <laughs> right? And uh, you know, like these are kind of what the environments were looking. And I, I talked to the art team a little bit about this before, and I was asking them, you know, the motivation behind the switch. And it, and it's interesting because just as I feel like I've grown up with the game, you know, I, a lot of the studio was growing up too. And I think you ended up having people who, like, they have kids now. They're like, I kind of want to play this game with my kids, and this is like super grim, dark, <laughs> right? And you know, Gears itself kind of always had this, like, I think the tagline they always used was, like, destroyed beauty, and it always looked like everything was demolished. And I think there was a little bit of fatigue, too, right? Like, hey, our studio has been doing this for a long time. Like, let's show we can do something else. Now, ultimately, also, I think the, the more stylized art choice lends itself to being a slightly more, like, timeless or, like, more relevant through the years as well. Like, if you had gone hyper-realistic for this, like, six years ago, and then we tried to release it now, like, it probably visually wouldn't hold up. We would have had to continually... Kind of update it. 
uh, though all of this, when I started, right, I joined and they were in the hubbub of getting ready to announce this for the first time, even back when it was small. And it led to a VGA trailer in 2011. They released, just so you can see how different this is. So even back then, I mean, there were some elements that obviously we retained, like some of those monsters are very similar to the ones that are in the game right now. Um, but back then, that was still when it was a very small, tiny scope that was very centralized on, you know, this little teeny base that you're building, and that's it, right? Like, it's a very small session-based thing. We didn't have any RPG elements that are present now. There was no progression. There was none of that stuff. So moving forward, you know, I think... Everyone, what people latched onto, even in those initial ones, though, was the building mechanic, right? Like, that was the thing. That was what we wanted to go through. And so I had done a GDC talk about how we had made some of the initial decisions and how we went through the building system. And I, I've stolen part of that and put it back in here just to show you as an example, right? Because I think we knew early on we always wanted people to be able to build crazy castles and do all this kind of stuff, whatever they wanted. And yeah, I already talked about that. The, <laughs> the key thing is that we always wanted to support like this creativity aspect. You can go build the crazy castle of your dream. You can go make whatever you want. But we still were going to be an action game and kind of trying to find that balance. Like, how does a building system fit into, like, there could be combat at any time and all these other things. And so one of the very first decisions you have to make is how, how are the building pieces even going to function, right? Are you going to pick the little small granular piece, maybe more like akin to like what Minecraft does, right? Like the little squares. Are you going to pick a full-size wall? Are you going to pick a whole prefabbed building? And each of those has very specific trade-offs, right? The further you get over here, the faster people can build, for sure, which is very conducive to an action game. But the more you go over here, the more you let the creative people fly, right? Like, they have total control over what they build because the scale is so small, they can make all those crazy things. We started with and ended with picking in the middle um, because it was a good balance in between. You know, if, you, if we had gone maybe to the two small part, or the, like the small one, it probably wouldn't have been fast enough for combat. And then you also have the people who like action games but maybe aren't as as creative or not as totally into that stuff and then if they if they feel like they can't actually make anything because like well I'm not creative enough to put these blocks together in a format that feels good right they might they might be disinterested uh, it also gave us a lot of visual flexibility. Our artists like to do lots of cool polishy things and, and art. And if it's like a little block, that's kind of hard. If it's a big building, you can do it some. But here they were able to do, you know, whenever you put a building down, like the, the planks fly up and all kinds of stuff happens, right? It let them show off a lot of that stuff as well. And it kind of naturally resonates, right? If you're not a building game player and you're not used to it, you, you still understand the concept of a wall, right? This is a wall. This is a floor. Got it. And so the next thing that had to come up was like, how do you actually pick these pieces? And then how do you place them if we're going to go with the scheme? And so all of the stuff I'm going to show you is like ridiculously early prototype broken stuff. Uh, so here is one of the initial things, right? Like you're going to hold the building in front of you. Which piece you have is actually adjusting based on your camera. Like if you look down, hey, there's a floor. If you look up, it's a wall. And then there's a mouse wheel scroll changing variants. Like, oh, I want some windows. And then to build it, like it puts a frame down. And then to build it, you're like hitting it with a melee weapon. And then it's not in this video, but if you wanted to tear stuff down, you're also hitting it with a melee weapon, right? So we had the first thing up and running. And, you know, hey, something works. You can place buildings. Like, we were, we were riding that high. It's like, it's awesome. But there were a lot of problems as well. That camera look feature is actually kind of pretty disorienting, particularly when you get into, like, more complex, like, what if in the middle I wanted to put stairs? Now where do I look, right? Like, <laughs> it's like, what am I doing? Uh, the selection thing was kind of unsustainable because, yeah, it's cool when you have four variants and there's like a thing with a window in it, but when you have a million pieces of the mouse wheel thing and you have no idea what's coming up, doesn't work very well. That contextual melee thing, I didn't show you the frustrating part, but it was borderline infuriating because you're sitting there and you're like, oh, man, hitting this, hitting this. The second it would complete, now you're switching into destruction mode. So it finished and now you're tearing it down. <laughs> and people are like, oh, <laughs> this is awful. So... 
then we're like, all right, you know what we're gonna do? We're gonna put in a standard quick bar, and then what if we just put the building pieces on the quick bar? And then you wanna talk programmer art. There you go, that's, that's me at work, <laughs> right? <laughs> okay, that's, that's my specialty. Uh, <laughs> So we go ahead and do that, and we're like, there we go, we're gonna solve some problems. What'll happen is you press a key, switches you to the build version of the quick bar, problem solved, right? So we got this other iteration. We even wrote build mode, we're like, they're definitely gonna get it, look how it says build mode, right? And we put in a fancier version of the mini game, build up, this is the next version. This one, as you might guess, also was not great. Um, so the piece selection, definitely more clear. You could tell what you were gonna pick, it was faster, you could just press the hotkey, so you know, we make some incremental gains there. We even snuck in a chance for mastery in the minigame, because I don't know if you like, if you notice in the minigame, every time you like hit the sweet spot, you are like actually cartoon animating faster and faster, right? You were building it faster. So we give you a chance for like growth, being good at that, you can build it. Uh, that bar toggle thing was super disorienting, particularly because we straight swapped it. Like you couldn't even see the other one when it happened. So people would just switch it and then forget what they were doing. And it was also a fixed size. So sure, we made the mouse wheel thing a little bit better, but now there's nine pieces you can have <laughs> instead of like four. Uh, and it's still hard to find a piece in a hurry. Now, obviously, my programmer art did not help things. But even when we put real art in there, like when you're deciding between do I want the thing with two windows or do I want the one with one window but only on the left, trying to pick that off of a skill tree bar is actually still kind of hard, right? And building is slow. You're sitting there, like you go through all these processes of picking it, you put it down. Like this isn't going to hold up in an action game, right? As people are coming to engage you. So there's also the confusion as well over the contextual melee thing. That bar switch did nothing to fix that. People are still smashing their own buildings down and yelling at me. So we're like, all right, here's what we're going to do. We're going to take all of these melee weapons and we're going to split them up. And some of them are only for building and some of them are only for combat. So take that, right? Now you can't break your stuff. Stop yelling at me. And then <laughs> we're going to put them on the quick bar. And then the building tool will also be on the quick bar. And then this is even going to fix the bar swap thing because you're going to click on the building tool and then it's going to switch. So you're going to make that mental connection. Got it, right? No problems. <laughs> <laughs> so solved in that I <laughs> took away your ability to do it. Uh, <laughs> but it caused pandemonium. So the key one, which you probably have already identified, what is the difference between a building tool and a melee weapon, particularly when they both kind of look like they're capable of hurting things? And so we would have a lot of play tests where people would be trying to melee things with that little building hammer and getting really mad. Or my favorite is they're building, they forget that they're building, they get attacked by monsters, they frantically left click, <laughs> and now there's like building frames going up everywhere, and, <laughs> and they're screaming and dying. <laughs> and, it was, yeah, I, I just remember like we had a playtest lab downstairs and I walked in to go see, I'm like walking to see how I was doing and it was like, oh, it's a hammer, damn it. And I'm like, right back up. <laughs> like, we're done. <laughs> we're done. Um, now, meanwhile, all this stuff is going on. You know, the art team is not sitting idly by. Like people have bought in on building. Like building is awesome, right? Let's, you know what we need is a million pieces. Like, <laughs> What if we had some balconies? What if we had some double back stairs? You know, wouldn't that be cool? Look how creative you could be with an archway. They're like, like I can't solve placing a wall right now. Like, <laughs> so, you know, what are we going to do? And they're like, wait, 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 wait. What if you could also mirror and rotate them? Mm -hmm. What if you could upgrade them? And what if you could switch their types? And so at this point, you know, we're kind of in like UI emergency mode. What does this look like, right? And we're starting to like wireframe and make gray box stuff. And I know that I went to our UI guys. And I'm like, look, no offense, but as we're working through this, I literally feel like I'm playing Microsoft Excel. Like, <laughs> like we're not, <laughs> we're not having a good time here. And so we're trying to figure it out. An interesting thing that we came along at the time, because at the time we were in the middle of an engine switch, which we'll talk about later. But it was slow to do UI work at the time with where the tool set was. So. In order to get through these whoops, these iterations very quickly, the, uh, our UI artist and I actually just started doing the UI in PowerPoint, <laughs> which I didn't think was going to be that good. And it ended up actually being super useful. We were able to like, probably, what if you had a radio menu? Like all of this is with just standard PowerPoint animations, right? It's not even that hard to put together once you like learn how to play around with it. But then this was proof positive of how much this was going to be terrible, right? <laughs> like, oh, but wait, another menu pops up. And then it shows three other buttons. And then you get to click again, right? And we're like, OK. This is not going to be great. So I think we were like, all right, let's 
let's just pretend those other things don't exist for right this second. Let's go back to the basics, focus on what are the core different piece types that we want. And we decided we want a ceiling, like a floor, a wall, a roof, and stairs. Okay, I'm like, all right, if there were no variants and we only had the prototypical representation of each of these four, can we figure that out first and then go from there? So we moved to a case where we just took the four like basic template shapes, we put them on a separate quick bar they showed both at the same time. It was testing much better, right? Like people got it, they could build simple stuff. So then we're like, okay, we really do want those cool variants. Like I was pretty partial to the balconies myself, I'm not gonna lie. So I was like, all right, we'll get them in there. How could we do it? And so we're like, what if there was a way to break what we're working on into like more granular pieces, but perhaps after the fact? Like if you could edit a building that you put down. And so we came up with like, hey, what if you could turn the representation of the building into this? And then would this map to the other variant? So like say I punched that out and I punched that out, and then it automatically made a door for me, right? Like that would be pretty cool. And so we, we liked this idea as a concept. And then as we mapped it to the variants and the things that people wanted to make, we saw that it was actually lining up pretty well, right? Hey, that thing with the window is now this, right? Up oh, makes a window for you, right? So we were, we were pretty on board with that, and we're like, okay, cool, but walls were always going to be the easiest one. What about the other ones? Does it work for floors? And so you collect Colorado thing here. Oh, it did, right? We're like, okay, this is pretty good. And then the, the part I really like, too, is this kind of handles the rotation thing for free, right? Like, you don't have to think about the 3D math. You're not having to spam a rotate key. You can just carve out, the, like, I want it to look like this, and then it does it for the user behind the, behind the scenes. Then, you know, we kind of went into hard mode. We're like, okay, how are you going to deal with stairs and roofs? Because you can't cut them out, right? They're like directionally going up. Uh, and we had like, we were like, this is like 3DS Max or Meyer. One of the, I'm not an artist. <laughs> and so there's like, you were like, what if we had to like, you know, like pull vertices around or whatever? Like, this is insane. Like, people aren't going to do this in a game. So kept thinking about it a little bit more. We got to the roof, it, the roof pieces and we're like, well, you know what? You could still show the same visualization, but what if we, instead of punching them out, we treated them as elevation changes, right? So when you click on one, burp, that piece goes down and then it makes that shape, right? So we were, pretty, we were pretty happy with that too for roofs. But then we knew the final boss was gonna be stairs, right? Like stair, <laughs> stairs were gonna be brutal because we, like, we started down this road and like, okay, this, <laughs> like, this looks insane. Like, what are, you, what are you doing? And so we throw that away. Then we were like, okay, what if, what if we put like little start and end widgets and then you could like pick up the end widget and like move it and be like, hey, would you end over here please? And it would change the stairs. <laughs> like, no, we don't really like that either. But we did come up with, we liked the drag mechanics. So we're like, what if instead we kept kind of this thing, but we identified as you were interacting with these blue panels, the way you dragged, almost like you were painting on it. So now you could like click down here, drag across, drag across, and then that would make the stairs that followed like your mouse cursor track. Right? So that's how we ended up handling the stairs. From there, we ended up doing some other things that kind of cleaned up stuff. So in lieu of the hammer that caused so much playtest frustration and had people cursing my name, now you have a piece of paper in your hand. Good luck beating somebody to death with that, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so we showed them that, which unfortunately meant rip to the building mini game, done. Um, you know, we had spent time polishing that. That thing was like pretty sweet looking. It had a cool like cartoony thing, but we're like, hey, to actually achieve the gameplay that we want, you've got to be willing to throw some of this stuff away, right? We had spent time on it, and that's fine, but you want to be able to build quickly in this game that's more important than having the fun little animated little happy building mini game, and it's causing problems, throw it away. Here's what it looked like with two quick bars. It's much simpler when you only have to show the prototype shapes. There's no confusion that this is separate. There's no like swapping back and forth. And so we drastically reduced the building confusion. The variants just got themselves out of the way, right? They're, they're hidden behind the edit mode. They don't have to be accounted for any other way. Building is now very fast, right? You pick the thing on there, you click, it's down. Uh, the 3D math, as I mentioned, is abstracted away. The user doesn't have to worry about that. And contextual melee is solved because once again, we completely, we just removed it. You can't even do it, so there. Um, the dual bars are still a little clunky though. And there's no way at this time to upgrade or convert between the types, which was the next required feature. So we're like, all right. We, t we did okay here, now let's go tackle this next challenge, right? So here we kind of screwed this one up, right? We were riding the high, we're like, yep, yep, that in-world stuff is great. What if we just keep on doing that? So we're like, okay, let's say you've got a building and it's broken. What if I put another of the same copy right on top of it, fixed, right? We're like, we're gonna try that. And then upgrade one plus one equals two. If I take that level <laughs> one one wall and I put another one on top of it, bam, upgraded, right? And so we went down this route and we, we put all the features in and you can see like, so here you go. This is somebody which is impossible to tell holding a stone building over a wood wall telling you it's going to convert them if you click right now. 
And then here's somebody who's trying to upgrade wood walls to level two because they're holding a wood wall over a wood wall. And then here's somebody repairing an existing one. But as you can see, like this is super not clear, right? Like this was a big clunky mess. So yes, we did check the check boxes. You could do these things, uh, but you could not do them well. The controls were very slow, particularly like once you've actually built a base and you've got some walls over here and a floor over here or whatever, say you need to repair all of them. Now you've got to stop and like piece match them all. Hold on, switch to the floors. Oh, hold on, switch over here, right? This just feels bad. It was very slow and it was confusing. It was also garish if you're on the R team, like they, they were not thrilled with all those icons that I was injecting all over the place in the world. And so there were just too many operations. And so we went back to like, you know what, why, why don't we just give you contextual prompts? Like, why don't we just let you do this whenever you want when you're near a building? And so that also meant ripped material conversion because we were like, we don't want to put a million, a million different prompts in here. And the conversion thing was not used that much. So we didn't think it was a huge loss. Ended up fast, you know, kind of reduced the cognitive load, what we're expecting the player to be able to understand and take in, right? Other games have already certainly always had the contextual hotkey that does things, right? Just straightforward translation. Uh, and we're able to give contextual hints, right? Otherwise, there was no way to know the way to repair things is to overlap stuff, right? But now when you walk up, even if you don't know repairs in the game, there's this little contextual bubble like, hey, don't you want to repair me right now? Right? And you get that kind of for free. We did lose the conversion feature, but I don't think we were super heartbroken about it. And then since then, you know, we've kind of done more polished stuff. So like that piece of paper now actually shows even which material you're building with when you're looking at it, right? So it's another reinforcement. We kind of cleaned up some of these icons and then the double bar thing ended up with like these change sizes based on which one's selected so it's more prominent. There's a quick hotkey that's also labeled showing you're gonna like switch between the two different modes. And then this is a video from one of the other trailers that kind of shows off what the current state of things looks like. So that's, that's kind of its current state, um, which you know satisfies the initial design intent, right? Like we checked all the check boxes that we were hoping to be able to accomplish, which is always a win. Um, it unfurls kind of through experimentation, which is a part of it that I actually really like. You can just use this and build a basic little square thing and make your little cube house just really simply, right? You don't need to know that there's all these other shapes. You don't have to worry about the balcony, even though you should, because it's really cool looking, but you don't have to in order to play, and it's all, it's like a huge avenue for mastery and growth, right? This is probably my favorite aspect of the whole system as somebody who worked on it and like gameplay design standpoint, right? You can watch people play this game and you can definitely tell the people who are amazing builders, right? Like they have it on lockdown. There are so many, like they're so fast with the edit mode, they know all of the pieces and like when they're applicable and they can build all these crazy shapes, but it doesn't feel like that's completely necessary to be successful at the game, right? You can still make your little box that's going to defend you from the guys that are running, running right in your face. But as like the video showed, you know, if you want to do the sniper tower and you want to do all those kind of things, the system allows you to do that in a way that doesn't get in the way. There are some parts that are still a bit clunky, like the stairs work with the dragging stuff, but it is, it's divergent enough from the rest that it's still not an immediate like, oh, I should just drag on this and it'll work, right? It, it still requires learning. And it does take a little bit to get used to the bar swap. But overall, I think you know this was a good example of kind of what my job looks like, right? Like we do iteration through gameplay features. Sometimes we make dumb mistakes, right? And then looking back at it, it's like, man, why did we even think that was a good idea in the first place, right? But that's that's part of it. You know, I, I think a good functioning team too, like doesn't judge those decisions, right? Like people are gonna come up with dumb ideas and if it's cheap to try them out, Go for it, right? Like, it's not a huge deal. So going forward, kind of from then, that was early through the rest of this. And obviously, I'm going to skip a ton of things because if we covered six years worth of stuff, we would be here all day. But I wanted to cover you know, some of the things that we kind of learned as a company, as the company was growing, as the game was growing, you know, as I was growing. 
And so I think the big one, like one of the central tenets that I think Epic is all in on is eating your own dog food, right? If you make a thing and you expect other people to use it, that you use it yourself, that you know what the problems are, that you go through the whole process, right? And so for us, we're you know a very unique iteration of having the engine team in-house with the game team, right? And that's that's an important part of the business to make sure that the engine is as good as it can be and so are our games. And in fact, on this note, like we were in Fortnite, like we had that building stuff, like a lot of those videos I was showing you were actually from UE3, right? We were on the old engine. We had started before UE4 had even started. Engine team's working on UE4 and they're getting it further and further along. And then I think we had this moment where we're like, wait a minute, we're making UE4 in-house and literally none of our projects are using it. Like, what are we doing? So we're like, okay, it's time to switch Fortnite to UE4, which was, you know, at the time, crazy, right? Because here's the thing. There's a lot of engineering work to do that. Like, you know, the initial, like, getting the engine up stable, running for the first time, right? This is a whole engine release that's coming along for the very first time. The artists don't stop working, right? But there's nothing that they can really do on the game because literally all of our gameplay programmers are now trying to port all of our existing stuff. So we ended up in this really weird spot on Fortnite where the artists had gotten so far ahead that by the time we got back to UE4 and like they had made so many amazing things, people were like, game's ready to ship. This thing looks amazing. And then you play it and like none of the gameplay is there. Like it feels super busted. And so people are like, what did you, what did you guys do? Like, <laughs> like what, is, what is going on? And they're like, oh, it's, it's, trust me, it'll be fine. And, you know, at the same time, we're kind of learning while we're developing. This is, you know, UE4 brought, like, say, blueprints, right? The visual scripting thing for the first time that nobody knew how to use. It wasn't like we had a, a guide handed to us, like, this is the best practices. We had to try to figure out what was the best, right? And, like, trying to do that while you're developing. And then the one that's kind of funny is because the teams are all in and, like, Epic always is good at focusing on, like, one thing to work on together. The engine team actually had sent a couple of representatives down and then, they set one of these up in our wall. And they were like, we want to know how bad we're making your day every day <laughs> with, with some of these engine changes and how it's going. Like, point it out to us. And so, because, you know, the initial version, right, there's like, oh, we're changing, maybe we're going to change how some file formats work. So that stuff you had already done, uh, how about you do it again? And then, you know, there was, oh, we just put the system in and it crashes a lot because you're using it in a way that we didn't know yet, right? And all of this is really important to make the engine stable, right? You have a real game proving this out. But in the meanwhile, it kind of hurts. And so it was funny because they would always come in and check. And then a, a few days when it was like really bad, I would just like go. <laughs> and then I would just like turn around and, <laughs> and leave. But it was, it was a fun experience too, right? Like it would have been very easy for this to turn into something that like, felt antagonistic or malicious, but it wasn't, right? Because we knew that they cared about us, right? Like they did this as a joke because they were going to check in and we were going to work on it together and make it as good as we could. Um, on the blueprints thing, right? It's very often we get asked like, okay, I'm making a project in UE4 and you've got the blueprint visual scripting thing. When should I use one? When should I use the other? What do you guys do? So I'm not going to pretend that we have all the great answers because I, I think it does depend heavily on the project and who your staff are, right? And what their skill set is. For us, what we've mostly chosen to do is we implement the majority of the features in C++ first and then expose most of them so that they have a blueprint representation as well. So like in that building video, literally every one of those building pieces is a separate blueprint, but all of it is also built on native C++ code. And so that ends us in a spot where when a new feature comes along, we can also decide who it's appropriate to do it. Like, hey, gameplay engineer is free. They're going to go do this. They're just going to do this part in C++ and give some relevant hooks to the design team. Oh, the design team has a lot of bandwidth. They're going to do this part in blueprints, right? And so it gives us a lot of flexibility. Uh, and it's led to a lot of shared successes, right? So like, as I mentioned, if there's one thing that Epic is good at, it is at ra rallying around a common goal, right? Like as soon as somebody's like, hey, this is what the company's focus is, let's do it, right? Everybody's on board. It's like, okay, engine team's coming to help, this team's coming to help, we're all gonna get it together. And, and all this stuff feeds back to the public, which I think is a, a very important part of how Epic works and why Epic is successful. Because if you're just making an engine and you're just making tools for people, but you haven't gone through using it yourself, you haven't made games with it, you, you're only hypothetically guessing at what the problems are, right? And you can probably get a good guess, but until you're up super late at night and things are crashing and exploding and import is failing and all that stuff, right? You haven't gone through the trenches of like, okay, yeah, this is, this is rough. And so we get into this loop where sometimes the gameplay teams will make new features and be like, you know what? I bet other people would really enjoy these. And we wrote it in a way generic enough that we can share it. And we push it back into the engine code. We're like, here, everyone can use it now. And then other times, you know, we'll be in like, hey, this part of the engine is really rough to use, guys. This feels bad, like for our content creators. Can you help us out? And then the engine team comes in. They're like, yeah, this would help everybody out. Let's do it. 
Um, some big examples, right? So there's this feature without getting too technical called network dormancy that was basically made for Fortnite. If you look at Fortnite, you've got all of these buildings, you have all of these pieces that are actors that have like network state, right? Like they can be damaged, they can do all these things. And so Unreal always had this concept of what's called network relevancy, where you can basically be like, hey, as a, as a client playing this game, these things are really far away from me and I don't need to see them, so don't bother sending me network updates, right? Like let's not worry about that. But in this case, Fortnite has so many actors and they're so dense, right? They're all over the place that even that wasn't actually going to be good enough for performance, right? You, like, there's just too many demands on the, because of the kind of game that Fortnite is. So the game team and the engine team together kind of worked on this system where you can say, all right, look, we'll use that wall that I put the ZZZ on as an example. I can clearly see it. It is clearly relevant to me, but obviously nothing important is happening to it. So kind of put it in this like sleepy network state right now but still keep it as a networked actor. So if something huge happens, we'll, we will manually wake it up so that we know, and then we'll send it across. And then that's a way, like it's an optimization that we put into place that lets kind of a game like Fortnite that has all these huge actors function uh, more properly. And then we put that in the engine and now anyone can use it if they want. Uh, the other big thing, you know, that I can think of recently, there have been tons of examples over six years, right? But they also wanted to make a cinematic trailer for Fortnite. And this was a really great example to be able to drive some of the tools forward. So I'll show you the trail. I don't know if we're gonna watch the whole thing because it's kind of long, but this is what it looks like. So our team worked on putting this together. It's a cinematic trailer for Fortnite's release. And the reason I bring it up as the example of working with the engine is like this was actually using used to dri drive the sequencer tool that was going to be like more for you know setting up movie kind of style things in the engine forward. That trailer is done in real time. That is not a pre-rendered cinematic. That's running out of the engine in the editor, right? Like 
they use that to put those tools together and use that as the proof of like, yeah, you can do this kind of stuff directly using the tool set. You don't have to go spend time like doing the processing stuff. And there's actually a lot of like, I don't have the examples, but there's actually a lot of like third parties now who are realizing this as well, right? And there's there's actually like full uh, like kids cartoons now basically being made directly in the editor. Like they're just using very similar tools that this helped drive forward. So from there, I think the other, like a big hurdle that we had to take on in Fortnite that people just were totally not ready for is kind of what I put thinking systemically, right? If you if you look at Epic's past, you know, things that they've put out, like Gears of War or whatever, right? Mostly been very shooter focused, right? They're not heavy systems driven game. They're not heavy on like RPG elements. And so Fortnite, you know, we're like, hey, this is going to be a free to play game and it's going to be heavy on RPG elements. And that's kind of a mind shift if you're used to only making shooter games, right? There's a lot of stuff that you have to learn. And like, I'll, like, I'll be blunt. I didn't know system designer was a role, like when I, when I first got to Epic, right? And so we didn't actually have any. And so they're like, oh, well, we better go find some. And so, you know, we've hired people from MMO space, you know, who've done itemization on MMOs. And it, there were some growing pains there of going through that process of like, what does that mean to try to build things at that kind of scale? To be able to make okay, instead of gears, like having four or five weapons, what if you had to make 200? Like, what does that mean from a development standpoint? And that is a big departure from what Epic has done in the past for art, design, and engineering, both from the RPG and the free-to-play aspect, right? So, like, art-wise, yeah, we need tons of content. So you've got to be able to churn them out. We cannot spend, like, a year on a shotgun model, right? You've got to be able to get a little, you've got to have some kind of system in place to do that faster. Uh, the designers, you're kind of in a procedural, stat-driven, progress-driven thing that goes on. You're not going to be able to hand script every encounter. Like, what does that mean? How can you still make quality content when you don't have that kind of control, right? Learning all of those things. For engineering, you're building systems that are expected to both stand up under substantial load, like tons of people playing at the same time, and to be able to like hold their own for years at a time, right? Like, these are huge, robust systems that need to be able to provide very specific solutions for our designers to be able to make content in a way that doesn't make their pipeline super slow. Um, in terms of free-to-play thinking, too, right? Like I, I remember there was this <laughs> this thing in the company where everybody was like, "Well, of course, we just get everything, right? Like we're gonna log in. I, I get all the skins, right? I got all the weapons, right?" And I'm like, "No." And I'm like, "What? What do you mean no?" And it's like, "Cause it's very important to our team for the free-to-play stuff." We want to know what it feels like if you play our game and you literally don't spend money. We want to make sure that that feels OK. right? And there's still some work to be done there. But I do not spend a single dime. I don't have any of that stuff unlocked on my account. Like When I go play, I play as if I had just started for the first time, and I go see what that feels like. Because we want to know what that feels like. Uh, a good example of kind of the system-driven stuff, too, and of how it changes in the mindset is we knew that both Fortnite and actually Paragon, which is a MOBA that we did, was going to have like lots of player abilities, AI abilities. And we needed some kind of system written for that. And so we kind of gathered all the system designers we had hired to work on both of these teams and asked them their experience in the past, like working on, like we had people who worked on the Star Wars MMO, the Lord of the Rings MMO, all of them. They all, all described very similar system setups, like this is how this works. But then all of them were like, by the way, the version of this that got to us in a shippable state took like two to five man years of engineering effort to get in a space that was good. They're like, oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> right? So we had to have this, this time break where we went and took a section of our engineers, including myself, worked very closely with those system designers, and you're just doing nothing but foundational system work that has no like visual representation in the game, right? You're just churning away for months on like, let's get these engineering tasks, let's build this framework for people. And it can be demoralizing if people haven't gone through that before, right? Like it's really fun to work on stuff that's like, here you go. I put, I just worked on this prototype feature, like that shield thing I was talking about earlier, right? And it's in the game in two days. Look, look how awesome this is, right? To switch to, hey, I've been working on this system for six months. No, you can't use it yet because it's still not ready, right? <laughs> it's, a, it's a big switch to get used to. Um, separate from that also, we kind of had to start thinking about like, what does it feel like to actually incorporate actual data collection with, with uh, our data design? So when we were going through that process of iterating on the building system, we did not have a usability testing department, right? We didn't have a UX department. It was kind of us just seat of our pants, like, what about this? What about this? And so since that time, we've introduced the concept of doing usability testing where, you know, you have like kind of a blind area where people can play. You have like a setup, you observe like their eye tracking movements, you see like what they kind of see, you like record data and analytics from their play sessions, you gather feedback from them, and it's been actually really eye-opening, right? It reveals things that you like took for granted, like there's no way people are struggling with this, and then they are, and you're like, oh, well, we could go fix it. And 
my favorite example too, because this also proves out that you can't you can't just trust feedback that you get blindly given to you, right? Like people are really good at identifying problems and calling out things that they perceive as wrong, but they're maybe not always as good because they don't have all the context of the game of like this what the solution should be. Or sometimes they don't want to offend you. So they're going to be really polite. So my favorite example is one of the very first UX tests. The people playing didn't actually know that I was watching because I was in a different room. Like they knew that somebody might, but they didn't know the person who worked on it was watching. And I'm watching him try to use the building system for the first time. And I'm groaning as like he continues to stumble over stuff. And I'm like, oh, I thought we had nailed it. Oh, oh. He falls in a pit. And I'm like, uh-oh. So our game has a solution to this. It's a building game. You literally build stairs and you walk out of the pit. And I'm like, OK, he's going to figure this out. This poor soul trapped in this pit for 45 minutes. <laughs> like, And he's just sitting there like jumping against the wall. Like, It's all the way up here. And he's like, like for 45 minutes, he's trying to double jump, couldn't get out. He eventually figured out the stairs. He eventually got out, and I'm like, wow, we have work to do. I talked to him afterwards, and I'm like, hey, how did it go? How was it playing? And he's like, oh, man, great game, building system, super intuitive. I love it. It's like the best there is. Like, I cannot wait to go home. And I'm like, like what? And he was being totally serious, right? Like, as soon as he knew I had worked on it, feedback completely shifted, right? It is not... This was a mess, and you trapped me in a pit for 45 minutes. But if there wasn't a US test, I would have literally never known that. I would have heard, like, no problems, best that there is, ship it, right? And so this has been super eye-opening to go through. <laughs> um, other than that, there have been you know, other growing pains as we go through. Epic as a whole has been used to very tiny and centralized teams. Uh, the, the Gears of War team, was, I think the original one was, I don't even know the exact number. I think it was less than 30 people. It's like super small. Uh, Fortnite's team has always been relatively small compared to normal AAA standards. Like we don't have like 500 people on our dev team working on this game. And it's been awkward a little bit at parts because that's not always compatible with a live game, right? You're you're trying to build all these these infrastructure pieces. Like let me, um, yeah, you got you got new departments, right? So. If we're going to be this online game and it's going to be online all the time, people are going to have shared account persistence, there's going to be a database, all that stuff. Those aren't departments we had, right? You're going to be a free-to-play game and you're going to ask people to be able to like buy things. How do we get your money? We don't have a way to do it, right? Like we can't we can't even charge a credit card. So all of those kind of things during the development of this had to get built. At the same time, like the uh, UE4 came out and was publicly released and available for free. That's all infrastructure that has to be built, right? Like all of these things are stuff that during the development and people are like, well, how could it take so long? You just take for granted that those things exist. And when they don't and you have to build them, it takes a while, right? So there's been a lot of that. We have a you know a customer service department now. We have an online team that's focused in Seattle that does a lot of our backend work. Like our gameplay teams interface with them, but you know, they exist and they didn't used to. Um, also, you know, the thing that you run into too is we became a multi-game studio, right? Normally they've been like, hey, we're going to work on Gears of War, done. We're going to work on the next thing, done. Now it was like, we're going to do Paragon and we're going to do Fortnite. You know, we're working like UT team over in the corner. That presents unique challenges too, right? Because people are used to, oh, we're the, we're the game in the studio right now. We get all the resources. We need, we have all the help we could ever want whenever you want. You quickly realize with the multi-game studio, oh, there are some roles that we only have like one person in the studio who's really good at. Oh, now which team gets them? Like, and then you're like, oh no, we really want that person. Can we borrow them for a couple months? Like, so we had to go through some of that stuff. And through all of this, I think the key point is that the only way this even works is communication is super critical and you have to be really good at it. And this is where everyone falls asleep and it's super boring. And I, I know it's boring and I almost didn't want to put it in there, but I cannot stress how important communication is on the team. And in fact, if I could go back and tell a student me that probably the hardest part of working on a large scale game is the communication between the teams and the team members, I'd be like, you're a liar. No way, there's so many hard other parts. No, like the communication between team members, keeping people in sync is crazy hard. And if you think about it, like you kind of go through this rookie progression when you first work on a big team, right? Of like, well, there's other people, right? Like <laughs> I've got to work with other people. Oh. And they're not all programmers. They know other things. They have other expectations from me. They have their own ideas. Like, I'm not the idea guy. I don't get to run the show, right? You go through this, and I, I think this is the, like, the first immediate you're forced to embrace all of this stuff. But then moving on from there, there's a lot of skills and things that you start to notice, right? Like, why doesn't this work anymore, for instance? Oh, OK, there we go. People are wildly different, right? They have so many different motivations. They have different personality types. And it's really easy to do something that makes one person on the team ecstatic while completely demoralizing somebody else just because of how their personalities are, right? Um, 
even quality bar, this is a good example, like that we've, you know, we kind of argue about sometimes on our team and, and good natured. For me, I'm a gameplay first person all the time. Like that's who I've always been. So I'm like, hey, we got this cool gameplay feature. Let's get it out. I want to get it tested. And the art team's like, what are you doing? That looks like garbage. Like we got to put better stuff in. I'm like, what are you talking about? This shippable is ready to go. And they're like, nope, not shippable to us. And so you get some like, oh yeah, okay. What's what's most important to each of us is different. And surprise, each discipline is going to value their own <laughs> slightly more than the others. You're going to be shocked to hear that. So you have to go through some of that. Like, oh, okay, it'll be all right. Okay, you know, we'll we'll ship it out and we'll try it. Um, you know, I have always have this hypothetical meeting example, right? When you start thinking about it in these terms, you realize how hard even I'm actually thinking this right now about this presentation, by the way, of you got somebody who's like, they're in their corner, they're thinking of their task in your meeting, right? They don't even care what you're saying. They got more important stuff going on, they're there because they have to be. Then you got somebody's wishing you'd give a little bit more detail than you're giving right now, but uh, somebody else is wishing you'd kind of just shut up, right? They don't want to hear all the other stuff you're talking about. There's somebody who's really shy and cares a whole lot about what you're talking about, but this environment sucks for them. They don't want 40 people here. They're terrified to even talk, right? Sucks for them. And then, you know, there's somebody who's like, I've got more, I've got an important thing to say. I'm tuning you out. I'm waiting till it's my time, right? And then somebody in the quarter fights is playing with a fidget spinner, right? Like, <laughs> you gotta, <laughs> right? And so, how do you reconcile this on a big team? And, I'd say one thing, if you're an aspiring producer, this is your time to shine, right? Like really good producers cut through all this stuff. Like, hey, this is the important part of the meeting. Make sure meetings have agendas. Make sure we don't like drift. Get the important people in there and you know, make sure information is communicated out and where it needs to be. And then I found also that follow-up is important. This is so simple and a dumb concept that it's like a thing that I don't even think people think about, right? But that shy person in the meeting, as soon as you know and can pick up that they care, what I will often do in the thing that we're, when we're having like gameplay discussions or whatever, I'll go talk to them right afterwards and I'll be like, what did you think? Like, what are, what are your thoughts, right? And then they open up, like they're super excited that they got included, but I had to go make a note that they need a personal follow-up because that format is not good for them. And these are the kind of things that help actually drive the game team forward. And like I said, this is a super boring topic. Like the fact that I put four slides about communication in here is killing me on the inside. I want to talk about fun things, but <laughs> you know, like, this is important. And so I think the next step is a self-awareness component piece. Like you have to become very aware of who you are and how you function on the team. And that includes understanding the influence that you have on other people. This is a thing that I think through my career, I've probably learned the most and struggled the most with. It's very easy to have very specific intentions and have them get completely misinterpreted because maybe you don't understand how somebody's thinking. So a good example is, I hate micromanagement. I hate it, right? That's not my thing. I, I'm all about, you hire good people, you get them excited about something and then you get out of their way, right? You let them do it, they'll make awesome stuff. One of our engineers that we had hired was kind of working on a prototype of a thing that he was really passionate about. And it had crossed into a territory of a thing that I was also passionate about and I had worked on in the past. And so I made a point to go talk to him and say like, hey, has a heads up, here's some stuff that you're gonna run into that's like kind of friction and like has caused, been contentious in the past, just so you should know. My intention was literally to tell him that so that he wouldn't make some same mistakes and it would speed him along. The way it came across was that I was telling him what to do, right? Like, go do this specific thing, don't do this. And I didn't notice it right away until he mentioned it in passing. And then we were able to talk it out. I was like, dude, I would never micromanage you. That's not what I want to do. But if he didn't actually bring it up to me a follow, like another time, I would have just completely screwed that whole communication up, right? And made somebody mad. They wouldn't have, I wouldn't have even known. Um, likewise, raising issues to production. So I like to manage my own business, right? I like to try to get, make sure whatever feature I'm working on has got all of the stuff planned. I don't normally bother our producers that much unless it's something very important. New producers who, haven't, who aren't used to working with me don't necessarily know that. So they don't know that when I go to talk to them, what I'm telling you is super important and I'm expecting you to help me, right? I'm coming because I need your help to fix stuff. And so there's sometimes some miscommunications about like, I'll be like, why didn't you fix this super critical thing I just asked you about? <laughs> and they're like, oh, well, everyone always comes to us with stuff. I just assumed it was a normal thing. I'll get to it eventually. I was like, no, this was this was prize zero, right? But I didn't get that across to people. Likewise, passion, passion is the, probably the both, I would consider my greatest strength and greatest weakness. So I have been told that when I get in, you know, super excited about something and I'm working on a feature, that I can be a natural rallying cry for people, right? Like I can get them excited, like let's work on this, let's do this together, let's do it. At the same time, that cuts both ways. And if I'm not careful with what I do, particularly if I'm passionate about something, I screw stuff up if I'm not careful. A very good example is I'm very critical of the things that I work on, right? I know what I, like, this sucks. I wish I did this better. Like, we'll get this better. And the people that I work with, you know, they're used to that too because we'll be like, oh yeah, we could have done this better. Man, the first time 
I went into a review with like somebody else and they were working on something. I was like, oh, this is kind of garbage. We shouldn't do this. Like we should fix it. They had not worked with me and I didn't realize that. They took that as like a referendum that I came crashing down on them. Like that was, what you do is worthless. <laughs> like, you're like, get this out of here. And I saw them later in the day, like completely redoing what they were working on. And I was like, are you doing this because of me? And they're like, yeah, you said it was garbage. And I was like, oh, well. And I'm like, no, what I meant was we didn't finish the game plan that we intended, so it's not good yet. Not that what you did sucks. And they're like, oh, 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 okay. Right? But, like, <laughs> but man, it's so, you got to be so careful about that kind of stuff. I even did this at FIA. Like, there's this huge email chain that I was, I was the lead of our team, uh, engineering team on our capstone project, right? And I sent this email. We had a designer send us an email like, hey, this thing is broken and we really need help. And I forwarded it to one of our other engineers. And it's just you know, the way I phrase things. I'm like, hey, can you fix this so people don't have to whine about it, right? Did not mean, <laughs> did not mean <laughs> to be rude to people. He fixed it and then replied all to the whole team. <laughs> and then <laughs> I get a bunch of people in my room being like, really, that's what you think of us? That we just whine all the time? And I'm like, no, that's how I talk. That's the, like, I'm so sorry, I didn't mean it. <laughs> right? <laughs> so, you know, I think some practical tips that you can pick up here, particularly working on teams, this has gone probably the furthest for me is, you know, assuming you're in a corporate culture that isn't like backstabby, like people are trying to kill each other to get a position, which Epic is not like, thank goodness. It's very easy to alleviate almost any problem you're gonna have with communication to just like pause. Like if you're getting frustrated, be like, okay, we're both working on the same thing. We actually both have the same goal. They're super well-intentioned, even if they're not thinking that we should solve this the same way that I want to. And at the end of the day, we're working on video games, right? Like <laughs> we're not we're not like putting our lives in danger. We're not doing crazy stuff. We're having a fun time working on games. This person just wants to do something great. So do I. And that makes it super easy to be like, okay, let's hash out whatever's going on. The other thing is, you know, I think as you get more and more mature as a developer, you start to become more aware of the team and when they don't have context in something that prevents them from making a good decision, right? So a very good example of this that just happened lately. We were in a planning meeting. The artists are like, oh, we're going to make art for this thing. It's going to be great. And it's going to take like two days and we're going to hook it up and all that stuff. And I'm like, hey, by the way, I don't know if you guys know this. The last time we did something similar, the hookup actually took a week and a half because you're missing tech features that you think we have, but we don't. And so the last time you made the art, an engineer literally hard code fixed this for you just so we could ship it. But it is not a two day task. And we're like, oh crap, right? And that's the kind of stuff that once you get into the like being able to pick that up and like notice like there's no way they could know this because how could they know that we hacked this area of the code because they're not engineers, right? That you can help your team a lot and you can become much better as a developer. Uh, the other thing, another super simple, you don't even think about it, ask people very open and very simple questions that they cannot say yes or no to. So I often, like if I'm gonna leave for the day, I'll go talk to the designers I'm working with and I'm say, what do you need for me before I leave in an hour? You can't say yes or no. You now have to give me an answer and it's not awkward, so they have to think about it, right? Because it's very easy, particularly when you're busy, if somebody's like, hey, you need anything? No, I'm good. Like done, and you leave. And then the second you walk out the door, surprise, they actually needed your help. And now it's like, it's either an emergency or they have to go home because they can't make forward progress. Likewise, the same thing with the shy people, right? You can talk to them and be like, hey, what are your thoughts on this, right? They can't say yes or no, they have to answer you with a real answer. And that goes a really long way with communication. Uh, and then also realize that communication stuff is important in every direction under the sun, right? The way that you talk to your teammates, the way you talk to your bosses, and what, you know, we're learning how to interact with a player base on a live game, right? It's very important to us. We want to be transparent and we want to tell people what's going on when we're working on the game. But I think you'll probably see lots of examples from other developers too, where it's like you figure out how to communicate to people because if you tell the player base, we're going to have feature X by time Y, and then you go play it and it's like, it's not very good and you cut it. The player base isn't necessarily good about understanding that, right? They're like, well, you promised that feature. What's wrong with you? Why is it gone? Because they're not game developers. They, you shouldn't expect them to have that skill set and they understand. So it's kind of a thing that we've been working through too. Whew. So all of that stuff leading up to finally going live as a game, right? We just went early access this year, not too long ago. 
And it's been super surreal, right? Like you got people cosplaying characters. We have statues of things. And if you work on something for six years and then you see this, it's just like, my brain can't even process this, right? Every time I see it, I'm like, what? Like you have people enjoying mechanics that I helped work on and I feel like I've been locked away for so long, right? And you start getting feedback and you like watch people on Twitch and then they break your stuff and you're like, oh. <laughs> like it, it took all of my discipline on a lot of those things not to immediately like sign into Twitch and be like, I'm so sorry. Like I'm gonna fix it. <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna fix it right now. Like, <laughs> I didn't mean it. I didn't mean it. <laughs> it's like it's like this this tidal wave of feelings, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> because at the end of the day, like you've been working on this so long. And then you watch this person on Twitch who like makes this crazy building and has like this silly encounter and you're like, this is the reason I do this, right? Finally, after all these years, this is the reason that I do it and why I show up to work every day and I'm excited to do it. And then our community team had actually like once the PvP mode came out, they put together like this little montage of people playing and I just I just kept watching it over and over and over again because of all the silly stuff they do. Dude, like that's so cool, man. I love this game. I love those. I actually watched one yesterday where like this guy jumped off and he was he was getting ready to rocket launcher somebody in the back of the head without them knowing. But the guy did know and he just put a roof over his head right before he landed so he blew himself up. It was it was pretty great. But so with with all the positive energy for this stuff too, right, also comes an unexpected point. So when we released the PVE portion on early access, we weren't sure how many people were going to show up. But part of the early access part is like we know we have work to do still, right? It's not done. Some of the systems still need more time to bake. Not long after this happened, you were like, uh oh, <laughs> like that's a lot of people to support. And then they turned on the PvP mode. That was its day one numbers. And then they made the PvP mode free. And then that happened. And then that happened. And then that happened. Uh, <laughs> so, like, part of being a live game, it's kind of bonkers. Um, you know, it's a thing that I don't think we were quite prepared for that level. And that means a whole bunch of stuff for all of the different departments and the work you have to do, and including the team organization, right? 
We are a small team overall. We don't have tons of redundancy and who knows the systems and who knows the pieces. We don't have like, hey, your team A, your team B, and your team C, like we can all handle this together. So when we first launched, we actually had to split our engineering team because we're like, okay, well, we need to make sure for the early access launch that it's smooth and if somebody's ready to respond to critical problems. So we actually broke ourselves into like weird shifts. Like, hey, your shift starts at four in the morning. And then, like, yours is at 6 p.m., right? And we did a couple of rotations like that because we don't actually have a live team. So there was, like, part of that. The other thing is, you know, when you're working on a game, particularly, like, when we were in small, early alpha and only had a handful of people, you get a bug in from the QA staff, and they're like, hey, you know, we saw this bug once. Uh, we think it happens maybe one in 20 times or one in 40 times. You can kind of triage that down and be like, okay, well, this is, we'll deal with this later. When there's 10 million people, that's a lot of broken people. Right, like one in 10 applied to 10 million, not great, right? So then you start getting into all these like, okay, now you're almost like, I feel like we're like a forensic scientist of like, okay, we gotta figure out what's going on now. Let's go look at all of the logs we have available. Let's go look at the account state people have. Let's try to figure out what could have possibly happened. Oh, this person's internet hiccuped precisely during this one command, followed by this other one that timed out, but only if those exact happen in that order, then their account breaks, and you're like, oh no, <laughs> right? <laughs> and so a lot, of, a lot of work doing that kind of stuff. Um, I'd say that you know the thing that you're not prepared for too is, no matter how hard and how safe you think the critical systems are, you know, mistakes happen. And as somebody who's really passionate about what I do, it is a gut punch to wake up in the morning and have bugs from people like, your bug lost my progress. Like, that is the end of days for my career. Like, I feel so bad. Like, I mean, I'm like, oh my goodness. Like, throw everything away. This is all we're doing. Everyone leave me alone. We're going to fix this and hopefully get to recover their account. But that kind of stuff happens and it's rough. Um, and so I, live issues preempt everything, right? And this is a thing that we're still dealing with. Like there are still problems that we are fixing. There are some things we have to shore up, uh, and you attempt to support it as best you can. But sometimes, you know, it's there's only so much you can do. And also, we deal with tech debt, right? Like along along the way, particularly in a code base that has six years of development in it, right? You have some parts that are not as good as they could be. Uh, maybe they were just early prototypes and they haven't had the full development stack, right? The one that sticks out in my brain the most is, you know, kind of when we were first setting up the heroes, we weren't really quite sure how they were going to work and how it should lay out. And so to make a new hero requires the content designers to actually make a lot of assets, right? It should only be a handful in theory, but they have to hook up like tons of things and it's very error prone. And we haven't had time to get back to fix it, but it, it kills me every time I think about it because I know our designers when they're like, time to make some new heroes, they're like, time to make 50 new assets, thanks, right? Like, and that kind of stuff sucks. So that's also a trick of the live game is trying to figure out how to hook all that stuff up and, and get time to go back to that. Uh, at the same time, you know, players don't care about that stuff and nor, nor should they, that's not their job. They wanna see new content coming out all the time. So we've tried to, you know, you're trying to figure out how to structure your team to deal with all these problems and still make forward progress. And we, you know, like we just had a recent Halloween event that's still going on, like, uh, content team made a whole bunch, like a whole new quest line, all kinds of these crazy new heroes and stuff. And you know, it's been good. But I think the key takeaway from all this part is that like the other boring fall asleep skill <laughs> is time management. And it's really hard. And in particular, as an individual developer, especially if you care about the stuff that you're working on, you have to really have discipline yourself against feeling guilty for some of this stuff. And it, I'm a total hypocrite. I'm so bad about this, right? Like when Ron was sending me messages about like trying to get this together, I was so late in replying to some of these messages because it's very easy to be like, oh, okay, I spent all my day working on these live issues, but I really cared about the task that I was supposed to be doing. I'm gonna go do that too, right? <laughs> and then just stay there the whole time. No one's even telling you to do that, but you're like, but it's really important. I wanna get that done. And so it's you've gotta have a lot of discipline to guard yourself against that. And I, I've come to think about almost everything I do now in terms of the opportunity cost. Whereas you know, when I was younger, it was just like, here's a task, I'll do it, all right, let's do it, let's do it. Now I view it as like, doing this means I can't do X, Y, Z, right? And that's, I think, a thing that you have to kind of grow into. And with Crunch, I unfortunately have not met a developer yet that has not gone through Crunch somewhere in the industry. It's, it's still a thing. I think Epic as a whole is pretty good about it. Like, we don't have the, like, the ones that you hear about of like, you're gonna forcibly work seven days a week for 40 billion hours every day. Like, we don't have that. We do have a lot of the like, people are not quite as disciplined about this as they should be. And so they are gonna do their work and then they're gonna like, okay, Epic asked you maybe to stay a couple extra hours, but you really cared about your thing. So then you ended up staying like an extra eight hours 
and now you're like super wiped out. So it's really important to get in the habit of, you know, thinking through how you're going to spend your time. Hobbies help a lot. And so like for me, my outlet is I, I sing in a choral group, right? I don't think I'm particularly great, but I have a lot of fun. And I treat those as like completely off limits to everything else. When it is rehearsal time, it is rehearsal time. There's nothing else. I'm going to go there. I'm going to sing. I'm not going to do great, but I'm going to have fun. And I'm not going to think about all these problems. And so like that's, that's for me, like singing in a choral group. I shamelessly stole this video. Uh, that's me over there, <laughs> having a good old time. Um, I'll, I'll spare you. <laughs> Dan, see, look at that. So deep in love am I. All right. Um, so continuing to grow as a developer. So I, I did want to mention, I am the person at Epic who for Fortnite usually handles the internships for our gameplay programmer internships and like going through that. So I wanted to make sure that I give you guys some tips on how we expect like internship stuff to go and like what that looks like because people make a lot of dumb mistakes throughout the way. So first, and this is going to sound super harsh, but when you give us a resume or a portfolio or something, picture in your brain that someone is going to spend 10 seconds looking at it at most. And that's not because we don't care, quite the contrary. It's once it gets past the recruiting like filter and it comes to somebody like me, I have all those other responsibilities I just described to you. And so does all of our engineering team, right? All of these things going on. And any of the big companies get tons of applications, right? I think the last set that we went through, by the time it went through the, the, the filters and got to me and the rest of the engineers who were going to look at this, I think we had like 88 applications that we had to go through in a day and a half to choose who we actually wanted to spend time interviewing with. And it's, you know, it's great. I feel bad because I like, I, I think all these like student projects and things that people do are awesome. Like every time I look at somebody's resume, I'm like, I'm, I just want to go download that. Let's go play that game. Wouldn't that be cool? But there's no time because there's so many people. So you've really got to stand out. Like it's super important to lead strong. And obviously mine is going to be engineering focused, but I promise you this is true for the other disciplines too, right? Like put your best stuff forward, get across what you're good at, and then don't get hung up on rejection because of all of the reasons I just told you, right? There are so many steps along the way to getting there of any which of which could, you know, get you filtered for some reason. Just don't make dumb mistakes. And then if you don't get picked, don't fret too much about it. There are other companies out there in the world. And so, you know, the common dumb ones I see, and this this is hilarious, this still happens. I'll get I'll get letters like, oh my goodness, it has been my life's dream to work for you at Naughty Dog. <laughs> and I'm like, well <laughs> <And> so, <laughs> I'm like, okay. Well, nope. Uh, this is probably the most common one that really sucks. I hate to filter people on this. Lots of, you know, as people go to programs like FIRE, right, and you make group projects and you, you make really impressive things, they'll send a portfolio or a resume and literally don't explain what they did. So now I have to assume you did nothing because I can't give you credit for doing the whole project. So really, whenever you send something, make sure you make crystal clear, this is what I worked on. This is like, you know, what's important for that. Further, no proof of skills. Like, for our gameplay programmer ones, we ask that people have C++ knowledge, right? And that we don't expect you to necessarily have game dev in the industry experience, right? That's what we're going to teach you. That's where we're going to spend the time going through. We don't have time to teach you how to use C++. So we'll get some resumes sometimes that are like, oh yeah, I've been using C++ for two or three years. But then all of their projects or all of their samples are not in C++. And I'm like, well, again, I can't give you the benefit of the doubt, right? You've got to show me something that I can at least be like, okay, they probably got the basics. Portfolio and snippet stuff. Um, very often, you know, people will apply something with no portfolio at all, or it's messy or clunky or slow, right? The ones, the ones that break my heart, I think, the most are like people who very clearly have done a lot. They have a portfolio they're proud of, and then they kind of phone it in on the website or something. And like, and I'm not expecting it to be glorious, but if I literally can't figure out how to find the parts on your website, and I'm like fumbling all over the place, I hit a threshold where I'm like, well, if I can't spend any more time, whoop, sorry, and that that sucks, right? Um, I think back in my, I, I always, I always joke with my coworkers. If I were to apply the way that I applied back then, like I definitely wouldn't get, I didn't have a portfolio. I didn't have anything. And I, and I feel like it's become more important lately because with engine tools, like UE4 being free and you know, unity, all these things out there, the bar is really raised for what people can, can output. And so just sending off like a very simple like resume and be like, I would like to work here, please. is probably not enough at a place that gets tons and tons of applications. Uh, so, secrets they don't want you to know. Uh, so when I look at stuff, 
there's a there's a quote that uh, one of our production directors used to have is like those who ship win, and that means like don't get hung up on stuff, ship something. And this totally true. This is what I look like look for in internships too. Anyone can make like 50 different prototypes of a thing and then not complete anything and just be like, look at all this cool stuff I started. Not as impressive to me as I started and finished a thing. Like here it is, it's done. I went through the whole process and I did it. That's why like when you look at job postings, right, and they're like, please have a shipped title. Shipping things is hard. They want proof that you did it, right? Like the early parts of Fortnite, that's easy beans compared to like the last couple months of like, oh, now we're putting it all in the package together and we're dealing with live issues, right? Like it's hard. So I would much rather see like a project or two that you finished and you know, rather than see a billion different things. Now it doesn't mean they have to be huge, right? Because an important thing too is show me that you know how to scope things, right? So that could be, hey, for a small team, you did this thing that features like this one mechanic and it has a few levels, but you you kind of finished it end to end. You dealt with hooking up a UI. You dealt with like what the controls look like, right? You did all those kind of things. That's important. Uh, so the other thing that people take for granted or don't think about, your portfolio reveals a whole lot more about you than just what you worked on, right? When I'm interviewing or like looking at this stuff, I'm trying to pick somebody that I want to work with and somebody who is going to contribute positively to our code base. So I'll use the coder example. If you send me a code snippet and all the variable names are nonsense and there's no comments or whatever, I'm like, I don't want you in our code base. I don't care how impressive that code snippet is. I'm not even going to read what it does. I'm going to be like, Pfft. like, I don't want you submitting stuff in our code base. You're out. So there's that. And then there's also like, I want to work with you from a personality standpoint too. So you're, what you're showing me is presenting part of your personality. So I'll give you the catastrophic worst case that I can think of. Somebody sent me their website portfolio, had really impressive stuff in it. I was like, oh yeah, we should pass this person through. Then I was reading the details. They use the detail section describing all their group projects to only talk about how the rest of their group sucked and that they carried everybody and that their teammates were garbage. And I was like, and we're done. Like, I don't want that. <laughs> I don't want to work with that. Nobody wants to work with that. So you throw that away. Uh, mentioned the dev tool accessibility has removed a lot of excuses. You really should optimize for like now you know like the reviewer is not going to have a lot of time. Optimize for stuff that helps them out. So I also see people who are like, here's this video of this thing I worked on, and it's three and a half hours long. Right? It's like here's a full playthrough. Well now you've put it at the mercy of like I'm going to randomly scrub and hopefully I find the part that looks good. Right? So I always tell people, sure, you can have your three hour video, but make some very short ones. Like this is what I worked on, look at this laser focus, look how cool this is, right? Let me go watch that 10 second clip. Because assume you're gonna get five to 10 seconds, but if you catch my eye, I'm totally willing to stay there for a while. Like, all right, let's look, let's look this up. Uh, likewise, if you worked on something, put what tools and languages you use to make it, right? This goes back to the other thing. If you made your game in C++, be like, this game made in C++, bam, use the Unreal Engine, bam, right? And then I'm like, oh, okay, I have a basic understanding of the kind of stuff you probably went through. Um, then the other one, <laughs> this one's lame, but it's true. Reviewers are human too, right? And so you're going to hope that they review your stuff entirely on the merit of the stuff that you submit. But at the end of the day, they are also susceptible to presentation, right? You got to hit them with the razzle dazzle sometimes <laughs> on the presentation. So look, you sent us stuff. If it looks really bad, but the gameplay stuff is still there, I'm still going to look through it. Like, I'm going to get to the gameplay part. That's what I care about. I told you I'm mechanics first all day long. But it doesn't hurt your cause if it looks really cool, right? <laughs> I was like, oh, man, this is awesome. Let's go, let's go look. So there's that. Then the other thing that I always joke about, and we actually came up with a whole terminology for this because so many people did this so many times in a row that I now call it the Mass Effect Corollary, <laughs> is if you apply to a position, Make sure you're applying to something like that you know what they're expecting of you and apply appropriately. So for example, if you're applying to my gameplay program or intern position that I have open, I'm expecting you to talk about gameplay mechanics. That's going to be your job. That's what we're going to work on. That better be what you talk about. But I would say we went through this period where I'd be like, okay, let's talk about like a favorite game of yours or like what, what makes it cool. Let's talk about the mechanics. And people regurgitate the plot of Mass Effect to me. And I'm like, what are you doing? Like, look, I love Mass Effect, all right? Like, I sang along with him when he sang. I was all in. But I know the plot of Mass Effect, and literally anyone with access to Wikipedia can go also tell me the, the plot to Mass Effect. I want you to tell me about the gameplay mechanics. And if you care about narrative stuff, that's fine, right? There's a way that you can tie that into how it affects the game, right? Like, in particular, I, uh, in the past year, you know, I played the indie game uh, Undertale. I actually really liked how they tied in how their gameplay mechanics function along with how the story they're telling, right? This is really cool. That's the kind of thing that we could talk about. But if you're just going to tell me, like, let's talk about the history of the Solarians, like, 
come on, like, <laughs> not going to get hired. And in fact, this is off, this is my immediate response in the office. <laughs> Every time. Like, <laughs> love the game, but that's not how you want to do the apply, the application. All right. So let's say you get past that. You get into the interview. How are we going to do that? OK, look, this should be obvious, but if you apply to a game studio, you better have played their games before you talk to them. I swear, this is such a dumb mistake, and people make it over and over and over again. Interviews can be scary, right? They can ask you all kinds of crazy stuff. This is literally the only thing you can guarantee to have in common. Like if you come, you know I played Fortnite. So if you did too, now we have a shared easy thing to talk about, right? And that's usually how I lead a lot of my interviews. Let's talk about the game. What do you think? What would you improve? All that stuff. When the conversation starts with, did you play Fortnite? No. <laughs> All right. Right, and so now I have to fill that time with stupid, horrible questions that I think of off the top of my head. Now you're getting a graph theory question. Enjoy, right? Like, <laughs> 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 so you know, <laughs> the other thing is, no one can know everything, and I was so bad at this. Like, I did not listen to any of our instructors here. They can all give me the I told you so moment, right? Like. We were prepping to do the interview. I spent all of my time. I'm like, I have to learn the entirety of computer science because who knows what they're going to ask me. Here we go. Like, I'm just like, old, all my old books. I'm like studying that. They're like, no, don't worry about it. Like, just, you know your stuff. Focus on the interview. Practice that. Nope, nope. Like, spend a lot of time. Don't spend time practicing for the actual interview part itself. And then completely unprepared for what it means to act like somebody's asking me questions. Like, how do I reply to them? Oh, I didn't practice that at all. But let me tell you all these crazy factoids I know that are worthless because you're not even going to ask me about them because I stumbled pronouncing my name, right? Like, <laughs> so you should definitely practice that part too. And there's a further story to that we'll get to in a minute. But also expect when you get questions, expect like evolving questions, right? Like I think good interviewers will often, they ask you a baseline question that they expect maybe to be easy. They just want to see how you think it through. Then the follow-up will be the same question, but with more constraints on it. Like, what if you had to do this, but you had to keep it in constant memory? What if it had these performance constraints? What if you had to do this? Right? They want to see how you think through them. And they're not expecting on any of these questions either. Like, throughout an interview, I don't expect somebody to come in and know the answer to literally everything I ask. Some of them I'm coming up with on the fly. I literally just want to see how you respond to things that I'm throwing at you. And it's very easy to, like, kind of go into meltdown mode of, like, you're going through the evolution, you're going through the evolution, you get to like the third one, and you're like, oh, I don't know. And then just sit there and freeze and be like, don't know, right? I want to hear you talk it out, right? That's what their people are looking for. They just want to see what your mental thought process is. It's fine if you don't know all of them. I don't expect you to. But if you clam up and then you just stop talking, that kind of screws the interview up. Uh, know your own work. This kind of goes along with the play your own game thing. This is one other area where you should be able to shine, right? If I pick a thing off your resume, you better be able to talk in detail about it. Tell me why it was good, what it was bad, what you did right, what you did wrong. This is the easiest question in the world. They're asking you about yourself. Like, slam dunk this one. But a lot of people are like, uh, wasn't good. Worked on it for a year. You know. And it's like, <laughs> all right. <laughs> it's like, worst case, that shows, like, the, the worst takeaway would be that I don't even think you're passionate about what you're doing, which also death, right? Like, if I, if I don't think you're invested, then we're also out of there. We had a design candidate come in for a system designer for a full-time position. That dude was brilliant. I could tell he knew his stuff, but I felt like he had like trauma from his time in the industry, right? Like he was so not passionate and so bent out of shape. And we're like, it doesn't matter that you're one of the most qualified people we've ever interviewed. Like we don't want to work with you, right? Because we don't even think you're going to be excited about what you're doing. Um, yeah, and that goes into this, right? Your personality is on display. Part of the interview is me figuring out if I want to work with you every day, right? That's, that's important. And in fact, you should interview me back, right? When we're talking, I treat people who don't ask me any questions back with extreme suspicion. You're going to uproot your entire life, move across the country, start with strange people, and you don't have a single thing to ask me. There's nothing that crossed your mind, right? That's a little weird. Um, and then I always tell people to be prepared for the greatest villain of all is the whiteboard. Um, so not every place does whiteboard tests, but man, you better practice it in case they do, right? It doesn't even matter what people ask you. Go stand in front of a whiteboard. Go get some markers. Have your friends ask you random questions and get through what that feels like. I've got two terrible stories about this for me. Very first interview I ever did ties into what I was saying earlier. Didn't listen to Ron. Didn't listen to Todd. Didn't listen to Tom. Didn't practice it. Go to the whiteboard. In my first interview, they're asking me a code question. I'm sitting there writing it on the board. I'm left-handed. Marker smudges all the way down my hand, all the way down my arms. 
It's getting sweaty. It's a lot of pressure. <laughs> Turn around. Entire interview group blows up laughing in my face. <laughs> and I'm like, I was like, what did I write that is so wrong that they all are laughing at me? And they're like, no, it's because you look like a raccoon. You literally have markers <laughs> all over your face. But I was done. Like, it didn't matter. Like, that had destroyed. I wanted to cry. Like, I just wanted to sit there and cry in the middle of the interview. They could have asked me anything, and I was going to fail. Like, what is your name? It doesn't matter. It's over, right? So, <laughs> like, just pack it up. So you've got to practice it. Now, fortunately, that, in, that, that hor horrible situation prepared me for in the future happened again. I had another interview. The exact same thing happened. I had actually gotten marker all down my thing. This time, though, I went, ooh, and caught it. And then I ended up putting on, I had khakis on, so now I had like this racing stripe going down my pants. They called me on it. They were like, do you need to go to the bathroom? And I'm like, why? And they're like, oh, well, because you, you, know, you just disrespected the whole process and couldn't even come in with clean pants. Like, they're joking around, but I couldn't tell. Like, they're dead, they're like dead serious. Like, I can't even believe you come in here with dirty pants. Like, what are you doing? Like, just, just get out. And I, like, I was ready to mentally break again. I was like, no, no. Hold, and then they're like, then they were just like, like, just kidding, just kidding, go to the bathroom, clean up, it'll be fine, right? But if I hadn't gone through that first experience, that would have been a break again. That would have been like, well, <laughs> like we're finished. So you know, like once you get on the job, I think it's also really important embrace who you are, like both the good and bad. Be genuine about it. Like people don't want to work with phony people. Like, oh, I'm the best at everything. I know everything. No, you don't. Like you don't. There's so many things that I don't know that I I know that I'm bad at. That you know. I think ties into the other one, never stop learning. I try as hard as I can whenever I have spare time or downtime to like, I'm gonna go learn this part of the code base I don't know. I'm gonna go learn these other skills I don't know. I know I'm abysmal at animation stuff. Like whenever I work with our animators, I don't know what they're talking about. I don't know how their stuff works. Like that's just not my area. So then I feel bad because I can't help them that much. Uh, so, you know, like maybe I should go home and learn Blender a little bit and like fiddle around so I understand the basics. And so what you're about to see is probably the most graphically impressive thing I've shown you all night. I did this at home just so I could go through <laughs> the experience of like, what does it mean to animate something? And man, I gotta tell you, I was so excited about this. I was like, oh my god, look at his ears, my god, like, oh. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, I was, I was so excited. They're like, yeah, now I get it. So you know, it's like, it's super fun. <laughs> you know, that's terrible. Uh, and then the other thing that I always wish that somebody had told me, right, like. And it's imposter syndrome, and if you haven't heard of it, it's you know the concept of like no matter how skilled you get and no matter how much you actually know, feeling like a fraud that you don't actually know, right? Like somebody's gonna come along and then they're gonna pull off the covers and be like, haha, Billy doesn't know anything. Like he's been fooling you this whole time. He should be fired, right? <laughs> and I remember when I was a kid, and even in FIA, like I felt this all the time in FIA, right? I was like, oh man, all the other students are better than I am. Like they know so much more than I do. I can't compete with this. Game over. Game over, man. They're gonna find out. I'm gonna get fired. I'm gonna get. I'm gonna fail. And then I kind of transitioned into like, okay, that's because I'm a student. I'm a student. It's going to be better when I get in, in the industry. It's going to be fine. I feel this all the time. Like, I still feel this all the time. And I just want to tell you that because some of you might feel that way. I want you to know it is a natural thing. People in the industry, I've been in the industry for nine years, feel it all the time. And in fact, one day it was bothering me so much, I walked right into my boss's office and I was like, I think I'm a fraud. Like, <laughs> I had this conversation and he's like, oh, I feel that way all the time too. I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> Why don't we talk about this more? <laughs> and so I think it leads into another thing about like the perception of your peers is really important, right? So there's definitely a phase where you know you like, especially when I started Epic, I, there were some engineers that I thought were amazing, and I wanted to emulate them. Like, man, they're so they're so good. And when I even think of the steps necessary to get where they are, like I, this is just me now. Like, oh. <laughs> like, <laughs> Like, I can't, I can't do it. I, it's, <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. I really was just looking for an excuse to put that in here because I love it. But uh, <laughs> so you know, because I think it's easy when you look at these other developers of like, look at all this natural talent they have. Can't compete. Game over. Like I've got this, and so I'm never gonna be able to be like at the level they are. But. The more you pay attention and like the more that I've worked with some of these people that I really, you know, respect and admire and you watch what they do, you realize that this is selling them short. 
Like that's totally not true. And it's actually that they have a very impressive development skill set that they've worked on for a long time. It looks more like this, right? They are dedicated to what they're doing. They mentor people. They have a very diligent workflow, right? They know how to work through issues. And then you watch what they're doing and it's not anything magic. These are all things that you can individually improve on if you focus on them and don't just view it as this overwhelming package of like, oh my goodness, they're so much better than I will ever be. Uh, so a long-winded way of saying, like, you know, you can always improve on those things and keep learning through them. Uh, and I think as you, you know, grow as a developer, the next step to being a good developer is empowering your team and kind of shifting the focus from yourself to others where that makes sense and, you know, learning what, how to make your team more efficient, right? And it's like the Aristotle quote of the whole is greater than the sum of its parts is totally true, right? Like when you're, you're first in the industry and you're like, I'm all I'm going to focus, laser focus on getting this task done. This is what it's assigned to me. And I'm going to do it. And you could be doing really good work. You're getting a lot of stuff done. But that doesn't beat and can't compare with the person who does really good work that enables five other people to do really good work way faster, right? The output that you've just contributed to is monumental compared to you're just doing your own task. And so when you can start to think that way about how you can help the other people on your team be better, then it's, you know, it gets your whole team faster. And it's about that dog food thing that we talked about, right? You make a tool for somebody, you better use it first. You better know what's good and bad about it, how to use it. You know, that's that's why I feel so guilty that our heroes take so many assets to make. Because I tried to make one, and I'm like, this is abysmal. Like, we we can't do this. So, you know, that's on my list of things to fix. The other thing I think, particularly for engineers starting out, you know, the the tendency is like, those rascally designers and artists are going to break the damn game if I let them touch stuff. I'm going to give them nothing. There's going to be this little folder. They're going to put their art assets in there, and then I run the show. Like, <laughs> nobody else touches everything. And that's, that's kind of the wrong way to look at it, right? Like, you want to get your content creators in a spot, particularly as an engineer, where they can make tons of stuff. That does mean they are going to be able to break the game. But I'm going to, I promise you, clever people will find unique ways to break the game no matter how hard you try. So the tricky bit of this, you know, there's nuance, but it's, you know, figuring out where you can protect your teammates from making common mistakes and making the game crash and do terrible stuff versus how you can give them the most ability to do their work. And so like two examples from my own stuff, failing on both sides, right? We were rushing to get something in. They were importing this thing from a spreadsheet. They're like, here's the format we want. We're going to import this thing. And every, every way we list it is going to be name of thing, semicolon, name of thing, semicolon, name of thing, right? So on and so forth. Wrote a really simple thing to parse the form, like two minutes. I was like, here you go. Problem solved, problem solved. They submit name space semicolon. Crashed. I was like, well, I screwed screwed it up. Wasn't paying attention. It's my fault. Blew it. And then we also have this like collection book, U heavy UI feature in, in the engine or in our game in Fortnite. And there was a lot of like, OK, we want to put more of our widgets into C++ code. And I was like, OK. I took that to an extreme. I put literally the entire thing in C++ code. I did not expose much to blueprints. And so now, anytime there is a problem with the collection book or they want to make it look nicer, our UI artists come to me and they're like, so uh, about that collection book. And I'm like, oh, I'm so sorry. It's my fault. I didn't, I wouldn't do it. So like, you know, with Fortnite, I wouldn't expose all of Fortnite to blueprints. There are parts that are super critical that you don't want, you know, people messing with. But for the most part, we kind of let our designers free, right? We try to give them as many pieces as we can. Um, and then finally, like every time I do one of these talks, I think this is the one I end with every time, is to be a force multiplier. And what that means is very similar to what I was talking about before. Make your work multiply the work of other people, right? Empower them to do things. And there's this chart from a comic from XKCD I show every single time because I still love it to this day, where you put together how long could you work on making a task faster for somebody else to the point where it's no longer worth spending that time. And if you look at it as like, if you read the, the left part, if you could shave 30 seconds off of a task that happens 50 times a day, it would have been worth working on it for four weeks, which is crazy to think about, right? Like in the heat of development, you never think in that way. You don't, you, that's not a thing that you naturally think about. And if you have a team full of level designers or artists and they're constantly putting stuff together, they're easily going to hit the 50 time a day. They're probably going to hit more than that, right? So yes, it is worth you diverting two hours of your time if you speed them up by like 30 seconds, right? And once you think in those terms, you get really far, really fast. And that's how you know Epic can kind of accomplish some of these things and compete in the AAA space that they have teams smaller than you might expect, right? So I think that was a whole bunch of rambling nonsense. But I think I'm done if anyone has any questions. <laughs> Yep. As far as I know, 
as the whiteboard, if that's something that's really common? Um, is that more for programming? I, th I think yes, it's more. It's probably more for programming. Um, I do know, like I, I think we phased it out at Epic. I don't think we actually have it as part of our active interviews. I never did that part of the interview. Um, but I th is, think it is still fairly common in the industry. I do know that we, for a while, and I don't know if we still do, our system designers test also had it too, like right? working through scenarios of how to design stuff. Because um, the system designers are very math-centric. Like they work in Excel all the time. They're always doing spreadsheets. They're designing how these like systems piece together. So there, were, there was a component piece of that for there too. Um, I think some companies are starting to go away from it too, though, because it does put people, like in the situation I was in with the, the whiteboard marker thing, right? You might lose people who are actually really qualified because the pressure of being in front of a whiteboard is hard and strange, right? And it doesn't map directly to, like, at no point during the rest of my normal career am I on a timed clock in front of a whiteboard, right, to get my job done. And so it doesn't necessarily map all the way. So I think it's starting to be phased out a little bit, but it's still pretty common, I think. Yep. Yep. <clears throat> so I think I don't have a good answer for you, unfortunately. I can ask artists when I get back. I mean, off the top of my head, that sounds like a cool idea, but I, I don't want to be like, yeah, totally. And then artists be like, that's stupid. Uh, so I'll, I'll ask them and, and see what they say. I, like, the only thing I've ever heard out of them consistently is like, portfolio wise, they would prefer you had like, some really strong things and not a whole bunch of like, well, here's everything I ever worked on and only two of them are good and like the rest is filler. They'd prefer to just have the strong focused stuff. But unfortunately, not an artist. I mean, you saw the draft, right? Like. <laughs> so. yeah, you I would, I would probably do that. Um, yeah, I mean, I again, not in, not my department, but I, I imagine if I was looking through it, like I would appreciate the video to be able to go through to even see if like is it worth, you know, downloading and see, and you could call out like important spots and like why you made decisions about certain things. So I think I would do it. That I like learned at FIA or sense or. Uh, you know. OK. Uh, I'd say there's a pretty strong overlap, right? They're, they're very similar. Like, um, I think the thing I appreciated most about FIA was the exposure to working on an interdisciplinary team and what that meant like, right? Coming out of computer science degree in undergrad, that was always like, you work by yourself as an engineer or maybe with a handful of other people. And for me, too, I was definitely, and still I am, yeah, I mean, you might not believe it because I'm rambling, but I am very shy when I'm not like doing presentation stuff. And so actually like having that experience here and then having to go like through the improv stuff that Ron did, like I I credit that a lot to the foundational aspect of how I am actually successful at work, right? Because it's it's very similar. Um, I work with artists and designers all the time. And so there's a lot of trying to figure that out with them. Uh, I think the long hours I put in at FIA kind of preps you for like, <laughs> yeah, there's there is gonna be some crunch time. Um, I think FIA still holds my record for most number of like all-nighters. Like I don't think the industry has actually even hit as much as I did at like FIA in the tail end. I was like, oh, let's do it, do it, do it. Um, but yeah, I, I think they're they're pretty strongly correlated. My only industry experience has been it's that magnified. There's more people, there's more communication to deal with. There's crazier issues happening, right? That kind of stuff. Um, just out of curiosity, have you found any like like you mentioned imposter syndrome? I'm curious. If So it's dumb, but it's the communication thing again, right? Like hearing people that I completely respected and had worked with for years be like, yep, happens to me too. And then have the conversation went a really long way, right? Like, because I, I mentioned I brought it up to my boss and that helped a little, but then that actually gave me the confidence to go talk to some of our other senior engineers and be like, what do you think about this? And they're like, oh man, all the time. Like, I really like that thing you did. I wouldn't have been able to do it. I'm like, what? Like you think that way about me? I think that way about you, right? Like, like, <laughs> like that that kind of stuff goes really far, I think. So just just being open to talk about it, and even even for for me, like a thing that inspired a lot of even the confidence to do the initial talk was people online had started to talk about it more, like at other studios, 
And I was like, oh, maybe this is a real thing, right? And it's, it's an awkward thing if you've never talked about it before. Like, who wants to start a conversation with, like, I don't know what I'm doing. You shouldn't employ me, right? So <laughs> I think having a conversation. Yep. Uh, I was wondering how long each of those versions like took. Okay. Um, I think the like the initial part before there was an edit mode or whatever, that one was actually fairly long just because there was also a million other things going on at the same time, right? It was lying the foundation of the game. So the first part and the several iterations through were probably maybe a month and a half, uh, maybe a little bit more. Because there was also a lot of like, this is the very foundation, let's go do the play test stuff. The, when we did the edit mode thing and we're iterating through that, uh, most of that, uh, the initial design idea was from one of our level designers, um, David, and he came up and he approached me and he was like, hey, let's, let's talk about what this might look like. And we kind of tried to work out on paper how it might, it might go. That thing I think we started and finished and had a working thing that like was convincing people within two weeks. So. Um, we had them in a pretty good spot. Do you have any examples of features in Fortnite that were created exclusively blueprints? Exclusively blueprints. Let's see. Let me think about it. Here's <laughs> that's sound bad. The thing about that is, like, the ones that are probably exclusively blue blueprints mean somebody snuck it in and I don't know about it. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and then I find it and I'm like, what? What did you do? Uh, <laughs> uh, because for the most part, like our framework tends to be, like I said, we try to do it hybrid so that anyone can kind of contribute. I am positive there are. Um, I think a lot of, a lot of the like bouncing of like, like if you jump on a car and it bounces and like the lights move and all that stuff, people just added that stuff in in blueprints by themselves. Um, I do know there's a so because we're an RPG, we have a loot system, right? And we have a way that things drop or whatever. In one of those, like, everyone is super busy and the engineers are super busy, and this goes back to the empowering the team thing, we had kind of left some of our designers on out to dry for a little bit. We didn't have engineering support because we were busy on live issues, and they really wanted to be able to drop quest items. So there is a system that is awfully similar to the loot system, done entirely in blueprints, <laughs> dropping quest items. <laughs> and so that's, that's like number one on my hit list of like, I will destroy you and bring, <laughs> and bring it back in. <laughs> but, <laughs> it's like, I'm going to put it back. We're going to have a shared loot system. It's going to be great. Uh, I mean, it, it couldn't hurt. I guess it, it probably depends what kind of stuff you want to do, where you want to work, what kind of stuff you want to work on, right? Like, our equivalent of what you're talking about is like, I don't, I don't think we have a truly like super hardcore crossover. There's maybe like one or two people I can think of, and they they did spend time learning C++ on their own. Most of our our people, because of the way we're structured, they spent their tech kind of stuff in blueprints, right? Like they're like, okay, we're just going to do visual scripting. I don't know. I'm all about the learning train, so I think it, it doesn't hurt. And in particular, if you're if you're good with C sharp and you understand the basics, you know, like a lot of computer science concepts transfer over, right? It's not you don't have to be super intimidated by it, like oh, this is a whole new language. There's certainly some very key differences and things to make sure to pick up on. Yeah, but <laughs> but you know, I, it's probably not as hard a transition as people make it out to be. But. Mm -hmm. For like a programmer or a designer? Uh, like a designer. Okay. Um, I would probably, yeah, I, I mean, I wouldn't make it like, here's 75 things I did on here. I'd probably pick like, here are the three or four that I care, like that are the ones I'm most proud of. Here's what I worked on. Here's why this is good, right? That kind of stuff. And then if you wanted to put the other people, like the other parts maybe in a different section, like list, yeah, okay, here's, here's the back catalog if you wanted. But I would give them a laser focus on this is the stuff I'm most proud of and I want to make sure that you see. Because if it's a if it's a giant list also, like people kind of switch between projects sometimes with like, this is the big thing that I really worked on and I'm proud of. This is the thing I helped on for a week, right? And they like put them in chronological order. But I don't have that context. I don't know that this was the small one. And if I pick that one to look at and not the other one, then that's not what you want, right? So I think pick the ones that you think are the best, make a focus point of them, make it a small number, and then if you want, the other one somewhere else? That's what I would do. Yeah, 
Um, so I didn't, like, the last time I did this, I actually had like a thing about like, okay, for programming, here's some stuff you might not know. This time I'm not as well prepared, so I kind of figured I would just do, if anyone has like free form questions, I would, I would try to answer them. Uh, yeah, and I, I can show a couple of things for programming, but in general, like if there's a thing that you want to know that I might know, I could try to help you. There's a lot of parts of the engine I still don't know even after all these years, but I can try. So. Uh, you mentioned Fortnite was one of the game jet. Mm -hmm. uh, I was wondering, uh, who decided to host that game jet? Is, is this a thing that Epic does regularly? Um, how many people were involved? Were there any constraints on that right. game jet? So I don't know all the answers to that because it was started right before I actually started. Like it predates me. Um, the, I don't think it's a thing we do often, right? They were doing it as a, like, Gears is over, let's try to use this maybe to inspire what our next project might be. And because we're small, right, like, you do that, and now, hey, all of, all of the game developers are now committed to this new project. So as long as that project's going on, we don't have, like, a ton of, like, hey, let's go start a game jam so that we can go do another project. I know a lot of our developers participate in, you know, the public game jams that go on in the area, right? Like they still do that as a as a cool break, but it's not a thing that we do often internally. No. So the, the Fortnite was in development for six years and uh, the project came originally in the game jam mm -hmm. and you showed us uh, a huge iteration of process in the project. And six years are also is a long development time. And the question is, did you and your team ever Right. Right. I think super, super early on, there was like some discussions of like, well, you know, maybe we should cut it because you know there's a lot of open questions. Um, for the most part, I don't think through the rest there was, you know, because people people really liked the building mechanic, right? They really wanted to make a game about it, and I I think people realized as the ambition and scope and like we wanted to add all these things. It was a, we want to add these things, and we know it's going to take time. Um, for sure, though, six years is a long time to be on any individual project. So we, we have had some developers who have been like, you know, been working on this a long time. Now we're a multi-studio project. Can we, like, switch? Right? And so, like, Epic kind of tries to keep it like, okay, people need a break, or they need a they need some fresh air. You can go work on Paragon, right? Or you can go work on the engine team, or, you know, you can you can cycle around. So that, that helps a little bit. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's definitely a long time to commit to one thing. <laughs> yeah. So that's again where like it's super boring, but that's where the communication stuff helps so much too, right? Like a thing that we've done throughout our development, and we kind of do it in cycles. We don't do it all the time. Is it's really easy to lose sight of all the cool stuff you you have done or the things that you've accomplished because there's always a million things on fire. There's so many things that are broken all the time, right? So we sometimes do this like, you know what? It's show and tell time. Like get all the strike teams on all the things they've been working on. And now you're going to force them to put them in a video or a presentation, and they're going to show other people. And you sit back and you're like, oh, wow, we actually did a lot of stuff in a small amount of time. Look at all these cool pieces you did. And often the result of that, too, is, you know, on a big team, there's so much stuff going on, I can't know all the stuff that's happening, right? Like, the artist will have done something amazing. You're like, oh, I didn't even know we were working on that. That's so cool, right? And, like, things like that go a long way to com combating some of that, like, okay, I've been doing the same thing for a long time. We're still trying to finish this, <laughs> right? So... That's a tricky one. Um, let me think about that. Usually, like I think by the time we directly ask them for stuff, it's a very specific, hey, this is a precise use case we have. This is a thing that we could use. And because we have a use case and a this is why it's worthwhile to have and this is how it's going to help licensees, I think we're, we're usually pretty successful, right, if it lines up with the goals of the company. A lot of times, too, right, like there's, it's not like the engine is off off limits from us, right? Like there, a lot of it is like, oh, we want this, 
we're pretty sure we know how to do it. Let's just do it. Like, we'll go talk to the relevant people on the engine team. Like, hey, we're going to add this in this area of your expertise. Is that cool? Like, yep. All right, let's do it. Uh, and then we'll just do it ourselves. Yeah. So the ability system is actually a good example. Now, we don't support it very well because normally what we do is if we add something to the engine from the game team, we've cleared it, and it's a good it's a good thing to make sense. We're going to put it in the engine for everybody. And then it's like any other engine feature. The ability system is an example where the game team's worked on it. We know other projects would like something similar, so we want to make it available to them. But we kind of put it in like its own module with a like, this is super experimental, and you're not going to get as much support on it because it's this gigantic system that the game teams have worked on, and it's architected for system designers, like people who are all about being Excel all the time, right? So it's kind of clumsy. We haven't done like lots of workflow improvements. So if you're used to like, I'm just going to press this button in a blueprint, and it works, right? And then you go to the ability system, you're like, oh, what just happened, right? Like it's nowhere near as polished. But that's an example. Like that is all game team driven, right? There's tons of features there. It's super powerful. Right now, we haven't had the bandwidth to have one of our game teams like write up, here's how you use it, here's all the stuff. So it doesn't have like the normal level of documentation that's not fully supported. But you know, we kind of try to do that stuff. So I don't know if that answered your question or if I just went off on a. <laughs> Yeah, and a good example there too is like the networking stuff. I know our gameplay level networking stuff very well, uh, so I feel comfortable making any kind of like Fortnite level fixes for that. If we get into, I suspect I have discovered a bug or a feature missing at like the net driver, like net connection level, I'm like, all right, time to go talk to the networking team. Like, hey, here's what I think is going on. <laughs> like, this is you now, please help. <laughs> and then they do it, so. Thank you.